right. Well, we are back for 2022. It's a third season of To the Fullest with Jason Froberg. Let's see if I can get this right. Uh, make sure to subscribe. Give us a like. Ring the bell. Check out our PayPal. Check out our pa Patreon. And follow us on the so all the social media things. That was pretty close. Close enough. Good enough. Whatever. Nailed it. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? First try. First try. Today on the podcast, my very good friend, concert promoter and owner of Pulsar Presents, Mr. Patrick Pulsar Trout. How you glad doing? to be here, man. Oh, man. So glad to have you on, man. Been working, trying to get you in here, and uh, finally we made it happen. The stars aligned, and here you are sitting in front of me, my friend. Thank awesome, you so man. much. Thank you so much for the invite. Stoked to be on the podcast. Yeah, bro. It's, it's glad you're the first one of the uh, the third season, man. You know, the, Super uh, cool. the premiere. So, yeah, let's kick this thing off. Like, uh, you look great. I mean, we were talking before the break. You've been losing weight, man. You're doing all right. You know, uh, what, what you been up to uh, during this whole pandemic, sh sh like, uh, deal? I had another word in mind. <laughs> no worries. Um, well, I've uh, been kind of just trying to make chicken salad out of chicken that, so to speak, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. Um, I, uh, I took 2020 and did what I think most people did, which is I just tried to stay home and stay healthy and stay safe and stay close to my family. And then 2021, as things started to open up again, I kind of told myself, all right, well, now that shows are back and now that, you know, you know, now that we know what the new lay of the land is, let's let's focus on first and foremost, making sure that the shows are safe and, you know, run properly. But also I wanted to make sure that, you know, I had a, a good understanding of what people are actually wanting to see, because it's been you know, a year and a half, close to two years since a lot of people have even, some people have even gone to a concert. So a lot of it's just been kind of regaging, you know, what they actually want when they go out. Because I think, I think the expectation now in terms of what people expect when they go out to an event has changed significantly. And I think there has to be more there than just like a good band playing. There's got to be more of a get, so to speak. Yeah. No, I totally get that, man. It's uh, it's hard to get people out of their house with all the uh, streaming events that were going on, and everyone's kind of like used to like watching uh, in theater movies on HBO Max now, and and it's like getting people to do anything is like twice as hard as it was before the pandemic. Oh, absolutely. I think a lot of it too is that I think people's tolerance for things that they don't enjoy or that frustrate them has gone dramatically down in the past year and a half because. If you're not exposed to other people and to a lot of these other inconveniences in the public, you know, for so long, the minute you're hit with them again, you're going to be like, well, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> and, I, and I totally get it. I mean, and there's I think it's going to be interesting to see how uh, the next few years pan out, because, you know, even outside of beyond entertainment and other stuff, there's going to be a lot of areas where, you know, I think people's mindsets as to what they really want and need out of the things that they're paying for or the things that they're obligated to do. I think the expectations are really changing and I think they're changing faster than I think the expectations are changing faster than a lot of the people at the top can keep up with. But at least now it seems like there's a little bit more of an understanding of, yeah, things have changed. I think I think last year in some weird ways was almost harder than 2020 for a lot of people because I think 2021 there was too much of an expectation of, okay, well, we're over the hump. Things are going to go back to exactly the way they were. Yeah, that and didn't I happen. Exactly. And I don't and I think the biggest mistake I think we as a country made was trying to sell people on the idea that things were ever going to go back to the way they were, because truthfully, they're not. And honestly, in a lot of areas, they shouldn't. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I really like about, uh, you know, the COVID thing that happened was all the sanitation going on, man. You know, like nobody was ever wiping down anything, really, unless they were being forced to. And now there's like a lot more cleanliness and a lot more mindfulness about uh, sanitary procedures going on in, in restaurants and just basic facilities, man. And I, I dig that, and I, I hope that continues on. To, you know, no, at least for, for sure. For a couple of years. No, that's definitely, I think, going to be the new normal for a while. I think we're going to see a lot of... Um we're going to see a lot of the changes that have happened in the last couple of years uh, in terms of, you know, sanitation and things like masks and stuff. I mean, I don't think masks are ever going to go away fully because realistically, I mean, a lot of in a lot of other countries, people wear masks, you know, during flu season. They wear them during cold season, you know, and it's not being done because someone's mandating it. They're doing it as a common courtesy. Yeah. And I, I think, think just the mandates need to go away. Yeah. Forcing yeah. people to wear masks and forcing children to wear masks and shit like that. It's like. It should be a choice, like, you know, 50-50 down the line. If people want to wear them, they should wear them, you know, at this point. Yeah, I mean, at, at this point, I, my attitude is I can definitely, I mean, I do agree with the rules as far as, like, if you're going to be somewhere inside, you should definitely have to have one on, especially with, you know, with the new strains that are spreading as fast as they are. The thing I keep coming back to is we wouldn't be in this position if 
more people had been cooperative from the beginning and been like trying to work together on this. And I think, I think the biggest, the, the, the saddest thing about all of this in the last two years is that the whole thing just got so politicized that you can't have an opinion on it anymore without people assuming that, well, if you're pro mask, then you're automatically some like, you know, freedom hating socialist. Or if you're not really feeling the mask mandate, but you're still taking care of yourself, that you're some jerk who doesn't care about your fellow man. And I don't think that either of those is true. I think the truth yeah. is probably somewhere closer in the middle, but that's not a sellable narrative. Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of people land closer in the middle than they than is projected as far as like media and social oh, yeah. media. And uh, it's, it's just like, if you have any opinion slightly in any direction, then you're just considered hard that direction. Yeah, it's um, there's, you know, and it's and don't get me wrong. I mean, like there are some people who, in my opinion, kind of do the whole concept of being centrist a bad name because what they really are saying when they say, "Well, I'm a centrist," is what they're really saying is, "Well, I don't really want to have any p opinions that are inconvenient." Yeah, because I don't want to have to explain them or justify them. So I'd kind of rather just ride the fence. To me, there's a difference between that and like someone who's willing to actually really look at both sides of an issue and go with it. But again, this was never a political issue. It was a public safety issue. And the fact that it got twisted into something else, I think, has been the biggest problem. Oh, yeah. Big time. Well, you know, is it just anything to like make Trump look as evil as possible in all directions was usually the narrative on all sides of things, man, you know? Yeah, and I mean, and now a year later, it's, everything's being written to make Biden look as bad as possible. It's kind mm -hmm. of like, you know, it's kind of like no matter no matter who won this last election, everyone was going to be mad. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that's going to be the same. I think it's going to be that way for the next few elections, honestly. It would not surprise me at all if we had a series of one-term presidents just because nobody could make up their mind as to what they actually want. Yeah. Well, they just and, know they're mad they don't have it at the moment. And nobody can do that job properly, man. Like, that's not a job that gets done properly. It's like the hardest job on the fucking planet. Trying 100%. To, trying to appease all this many people, you know, with this many differences of opinion. Yeah. Being and, completely manipulated in all directions, man. You know, it's just, like, impossible. Yeah, and at the end of the day, I mean, all politics is local. So, you know, it's like, you know, you can – someone can be doing things that are actually benefiting your life – but if you're not actually seeing it in front of you every day, you're not really thinking about it. I mean, I think that's one of the things that really I think this is one of the things where a lot of people who get frustrated about, you know, things like, well, you know, like whenever people try to pull the my tax dollars argument, a lot of times and don't get me wrong, there are plenty of things that taxes go to that I don't think they should. But at the same time, I look at it like, well, if you're thinking about it from the perspective of you get your tax bill at the end of the year and you're looking at the amount that's taken out of your check for taxes and you're like, oh, man, the government's taking this money from me. And you're not thinking about the fact that the road you drove to work on that day, the pothole got filled the week before. Or you're not thinking about the fact that your kid's in a public school. Or you're not thinking about the fact that, you know, all the different things that public funding and taxpayer funding goes into. If your house catches on fire, there's a there's a fire department coming to. Come yeah, to exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's like it's it's easy to not think about those things when those things aren't readily being thrown at your face and all you're seeing is the tab. Yeah. And I, I think that's kind of and, you know, but th that I think also comes down to, you know, that's again, that's a whole narrative that's been pushed on people is that, you know, people are taking things from you. Like there's this weird attitude, I feel like, in this country where it's like, there's this weird segment of the population that seems to think that if anything good happens for anyone else other than them, even if it's something they didn't even want, that it's somehow at their expense. Like, and it, it can be anything. It can be anything like, you know, it can be something that's big and expensive. It can even be something small. Like, and it, like, you, I see it on social media all the time where it's like, you know, someone will be mad that somebody had something, you know, even moderately good happen in their life. And I'm like, this isn't about you, man. This, this didn't hurt you in any way. Yeah. You know, someone getting a new job or getting a new outfit or, you know, having a good day, you know, that didn't screw up your day. You screwed up your day. Yeah. Well, that's the mental illness pandemic that's fucking happening in this country, man. You know, everybody's such solipsists and everybody thinks the world revolves around them and that their beck and desire needs to be fulfilled at all times, man. I think uh, I think a lot of that, too, is I mean. And I think a lot of that is the consequence, you know, a lot of that, honestly, I think comes down to marketing and advertising because yeah. we're, you know, we're built as a society to focus on ourselves first and foremost. It's, you know, it's self-care. It's, you know, it's, which I'm not saying self-care is a bad thing. It's not. But, you know, there's this focus on taking care of yourself first before, first and foremost, and making sure you're happy before you do anything for anyone else. And that isn't necessarily a bad mindset because you can't really help other people if you can't take care of yourself first. Yeah. But when it gets to the point where, all you're thinking about is, is this going to benefit me in some way down the line? And if it's not, I want nothing to do with it. I think that's where it starts getting a little bit weird. Oh, yeah. You know, and that's there's just a lot of that going on right now, man. 
Oh, and absolutely. A lot of people not wanting to contribute anything and expect all this shit for free. And a lot of people who don't want to contribute any tax money at all uh, besides the bare minimum. Yeah, know? I mean, it's and, like, you know, it's like I, you know, the whole thing of like, um, you know, and it's like, you know, I mean, I'm not under the illusion that like, I mean, like, don't get me wrong. I think billionaires absolutely should pay their taxes. They should pay more taxes than I do. They definitely do. I mean, yeah. they, they pay the majority of the taxes in the country. It just percentage wise, you know, we pay a higher percent. Uh, yeah. But I mean, they I, they pay out the ass. I mean, the amount of money Elon Musk paid alone last year was just astronomical. Yeah, which I mean, and that's and that's another thing too. Is like when you get to numbers that big, it's like, you know. When I look at the fact that someone paid twelve billion dollars in taxes, I'm like, well, I'm glad they did. But at the same time, I'm also thinking like, it, I remember like a few years back when Powerball was happening, and Powerball got up over like the one point five billion mark. And like, I, I remember like I was working a day job at Amazon at the time, and like you know everyone was like you know talking about wanting to go buy tickets and like asking about talking about what they'd spend the money on. And someone asked yeah. me like, what would you spend one and a half billion dollars on? And I was like, honestly, I'd probably keep like ten percent of it and give the rest away. Like, I mean. What am I going to do with that much money? Start a space program? Right. I mean, like, I mean, build a, get, bring a hockey team to town. We already got one. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't, I don't. Yeah, it's like, you know, like at a certain point, it's like, you know, I mean, stick it in a, stick it in a money bin, like Scrooge McDuck and Swan dive into it. I mean, I don't know what, what you even do with that kind of money. It's like, and that's the thing is like, if you've got, if I, if I can't imagine putting myself in a position where I have absolutely more than I could do anything with in the rest of my life. But still holding on to it out of some mindset that it's mine. Yeah, like I, that doesn't make sense to me. But at the same time, it's like I do think that there's definitely this. What I do think, I, one thing I have noticed a lot, especially when it comes to um, the last the last year with the pandemic, and I've noticed this a lot with um, with employers, or really not as much with employers, but just kind of with the way like the job market is in this country and like with the way like, you know, things are being changed, like this whole thing now with the tax code where they're trying to like, you know, make sure that people aren't, you know, skimming off of things like um, like uh, like Venmo and stuff like that, where they're like, you know, wanting to make sure that if you're doing more than six hundred dollars to the business, like, don't get me wrong. Yeah. If someone's doing a bunch of business and they're not paying taxes, that's fucked up. I'm not saying it's not. Or screwed up, sorry. Um, you, you fuck shit, piss and cut. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's 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 YouTube. I don't censor any of this. Right on. But um, yeah, with um, with that, it's kind of like I look at it more from the perspective of. Sorry, I'm kind of losing my train of thought. That's uh, all right. Uh, do you keep the whole thing as one long take or? Do yeah, you... we can. I can edit it, too. Or it's, okay, it's fine. Cool. Natural conversation is great. You know, No, for I mean? sure. No, I do. Every and once in a while, I might occasionally like have. That yeah, that like... happens, man. And I, <laughs> sure. I, you know, I could come in and jump in on the conversation. Another thing I was going to mention, too, is that a lot of these people that are like mega billionaires that have more money than they know what to do with. Most of that money when they die is entrusted to the uh, to like all these charities and, and yeah. organizations. So it's like they'll they'll play with their money as much as they want. And like grow it and grow it and grow it, and then they give like ninety percent of it to charity when they die. Yeah, and that's and that's another thing too. Like, there's a lot of stuff that I'm sure these guys do that doesn't get talked about simply because they don't want to broadcast it. I mean, yeah. it's kind of like I mean, um, I remember like Mike Elitz, the owner of uh, the Red Wings and the Tigers. I mean, after he passed away, like people found out after the fact that he had done a ton for charity that he never even publicized. I mean, same thing with George Michael when he passed away. There were all these different charities and like LGBT charities that he donated to that like. Basically, no one even knew that it was done until he was gone, and basically the money was just you know taken care of. But that was his plan the whole time, and I thought that was really really cool. And you know, and I, I compare that to like, I think there is kind of I think social media also kind of feeds into this. There's this sort of like performative um, form of trying to help people, where it's like it's less about trying to help someone and more about trying to make yourself look good because you're helping someone. Yeah, like, like this virtue whole thing, signaling to the yeah, world, virtue right? signaling, hundred percent. Like that, the whole thing with like you know, hey, um, you know, I'm gonna record myself, you know, you know, giving uh, giving money to a homeless person. I'm like, why'd you need to record that? Why'd you need to put that person on camera and potentially stress them out or embarrass them? Why don't you just give them the money and piss off? Like you know, just do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, not because you want likes. Yeah. So, I mean, and the thing is, like, I'm not, the thing is, if anyone does anything good for anybody, I think it's a good thing. But the problem is the minute you add that extra layer to it, it kind of, again, starts turning the gears in people's heads and making them question why you're really doing it. Yeah. If so it's a if sour anything, taste in people's mouths. Yeah, exactly. And everyone doing it for fame. Yeah. And then, and the thing is, like, the sad part about that is I think when people see that so much, it kind of makes them grow a little bit cynical about it. And it kind of makes them less likely to help. Yeah. Which, you know, to me is counterproductive to the whole thing. 
Well, and ultimately, man, when you're helping other people, that's going to bring your level of happiness up uh, immensely. You know, there, there's only so much self-indulgence you can do. And a lot of it is like empty and meaningless as far as like, I'm just going to sit around and eat junk food and drink beer and play video games all day so that I feel as good as possible. It's like, it's not going to make you feel as good as possible. But yeah. if you go out and you, you like donate your time, you go to an animal shelter and you help out some dogs or you go to a homeless shelter and you, you know, feed some people and like really like spread love around it's like that love is reciprocal and you can you can feel it coming back to you man and it's a way better way to make yourself feel better absolutely make the whole world feel better yeah most definitely i think um and that is one thing that i will say about the pandemic is that while the pandemic definitely stripped away a lot of layers over stripped the facade off a lot of things that people i think kind of assumed about either about this country or about their fellow people i think it also exposed a lot of good in the sense of like there were a lot of people who were you know making grocery runs for their neighbors who were you know going out of their way to make sure that you know the people around them who you know were potentially at more risk to get sick were protected there were a lot of people doing the right thing oh yeah and that i think is important and i think that that's something that really needs to be amplified more and i, I feel like I don't know. I think I think the biggest thing is just I think the most disappointing thing about the last two years for me is that I felt like and I and I and I felt this way since I was a kid. You know, I felt like as a country, we led by example. And I feel like I feel like in this last couple of years, we really haven't done that. I feel like we've kind of just yeah. we kind of, you know, it's either like we either we either capitulate to, you know, corporate interests or, you know, we kind of like or we offer lip service to people and pretend like we care. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a, it's been it's become a real self-indulgent country, man. Just narcissistic as it could possibly be. I mean, I'm I've never seen narcissism be pushed in on as hard as it has the last couple of years, man. And it's just encouraged. It's oh, just 100% really it's encouraged and encouraged in all levels, man, to just like really push in on this self-identification thing and what am I and who am what do I need and I, you know, this is what represents me and all this shit and it's like ultimately those uh, self-identification tactics and that narcissism and solipsism is like just the, like the core factors that lead to suffering in, the, in your life, man. And, you know, just the self, man, that, that whole identifying the self thing, it just ruins people. Yeah, I think well, with, with, with self-identification, I mean, I think definitely I, I'm, I will say that I'm really glad that a generation removed from when I was in school that, you know, People, young people especially, are a lot more comfortable, you know, expressing themselves and self-identifying and saying, hey, this is who I am and this is who I want to be. I, I actually think that's a good thing because, I mean, I remember 20 years ago in high school, you couldn't have those kind of conversations with your friends, especially your guy friends. You couldn't even talk about that stuff yeah. without getting made fun of or someone threatening to beat you up. Like, And I'm so glad that it's, you know, I'm not saying it's like, you know, I'm not saying it's all sunshine and rainbows and that everything's better now and that, you know, we've somehow managed to end that because we definitely haven't. There's still a long road ahead, but the fact that at least a generation removed, it's, you know, the fact that people aren't afraid to say, hey, this is who I am. This is who I want to be. And if you don't like it, you don't have to be part of my life. And I'm I'm very glad for that, that um, I do think that sometimes what I worry about sometimes is I think social media sometimes gives people a very and this I felt I felt this especially in 2016. I had so many friends who were so shocked that Hillary lost the election. <laughs> that night, like who were like, how the fuck did this happen? Like nothing yeah. indicated this was going to happen. And my reaction to them was, you know, again, and I was I was upset, too. I didn't vote for the other guy, but I looked at it and I was like, well, I saw this coming in the summer because I looked at the summer and I looked at how angry people were and the fact that nobody was really giving them a direction to be angry at except for one person. And the fact that all he had to do was flip four states that Romney couldn't. He had to flip Ohio, he had to flip uh, Wisconsin, he had to flip Michigan, and he had to flip Pennsylvania. Yeah, and she didn't give a shit about those states. Well, she never campaigned in them, really. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, was the she, thing. Was, she was doing mega rallies in L.A. and Chicago. Meanwhile, he's going on factory floors in Sheboygan and saying, hey, it's all these people's fault. You don't have jobs anymore. Yeah. It, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a crappy tactic, but it works. And at least they were looking at it from the perspective, well, at least he's here talking to us. Well, it's a game, right? There's, yeah. a, there's a game going on, and it's like you can't just – buy Baltic Avenue when you're playing Monopoly and go, this is bullshit. I, I'm better at everybody than this. It's like, no, he bought all the other properties. He went around the board and did the fucking game. You know, and it's just like campaigning in L.A. and Chicago and New York when you're the Democratic representative is such a fucking waste of time. I mean, you're going to get those no matter what. You yeah, don't have with, to do anything. And yeah. he, he went and grabbed all the points on the board 
And then she's like, oh, this is, you know, everyone just was blown away by it. Well, I mean, like, and, and, obvious and ironically, it kind of the same thing happened to her in the primaries in 2008 because Obama's team knew how to manage the superdelegate situation and her team really didn't. They kind of just thought they could just do their thing normally. Yeah. But I mean, like the, the thing I was uh, thinking about a lot with that election was like, I have so many friends who were like in this sort of like who were just com so completely bewildered as to how it happened that at first I was thinking, well, you know, maybe they just were kind of I was thinking, well, maybe they just weren't paying attention to the news. And I'm thinking, no, these people are news junkies. They read the news every day. And then it occurred to me they spent and I, and I, I knew people on both sides of the aisle who did this both in 2016 and also, quite frankly, most of 2020 were basically they kind of just cut off anyone or anything that didn't agree with their worldview. Oh, yeah. Which, I mean, you know, don't get me wrong. A lot of shit out there is just toxic. And yeah, you know what? Someone starts saying racist or sexist or homophobic or bigoted bullshit on my chant on, on, you know, on my feed or whatever. I'm going to block them. I don't need that person in my life. Yeah. But when it got to the point where people were blocking out anything that they didn't agree with to the point where they were even blocking out like the news and like what things were actually going on and kind of like keeping their ear to the ground. That to me was really scary because I was like, okay, if people can exist in this, if, if social media has evolved into where it's basically this much of a, of a bubble where I'm basically like, you know, in this echo chamber surrounded by people who only agree with me, that scares the hell out of me because then if anything changes or if anything goes wrong, I'm not finding out until it's too late to do anything about it. Yeah. And, and that, that's to me is like probably the thing that worries me the most about it is the sense of like, I mean, like with social media now, it's like, you know, like with Facebook, like the feed is not designed to get you, it's not even really designed even to buy, to get you to buy things anymore. It's designed to get you to like interact. And the way they get you to interact is they rile you up. Yeah. They, they know that you're going to react to things that make you angry or sad or upset. And they know that they can get clicks and they can get, you know, comments on that and get engagement. So they purposely pump those things into your feed. I mean, people make fun of TikTok all the time, but when I go on TikTok, you know, I'm getting, you know, videos of like, you know, hockey hits and like, you know, cute animals and like, you know, funny comedy stuff. I'm not getting bombarded with, you know, dog whistle racism or, you know, you know, all this other BS that, you know, that I know is designed to make me mad and make me not want to go on the app anymore. Yeah. And see, and that's the thing, though, it's like. I think, and that's the thing, it's not making me want to engage, it's making me want to disengage. And it does tie into, I think, entertainment in a way, because the thing is, over the last decade and a half, especially the last couple of years, the majority of people get their news about upcoming shows and events through social media. And if they're treating social media like this thing they're obligated to be on and not something like they actually want to actively engage with that affects that affects you know that affects everyone who advertises on the, on the sites that affects you know who their who their marketing reaches it also affects quite frankly who they're even marketing to so that's something that i think you know they really didn't factor in when they kind of wanted to when they when they steered the algorithm in that direction was it kind of created a this sort of weird situation where now it's like you know, you've got half the people on there who only want to be bombarded with things they already agree with and half the people who just don't want to go on there at all anymore. Yeah. And, you know, it's like I look at it from the from a promoter perspective of like, well, I've got social media, I've got physical promo, I've got radio, I've got, you know, different options for promoting my events. But when the most prominent one is the one that's also the most janky right now because of their own screw ups, it's kind of kind of difficult it definitely adds an extra extra layer of challenge to it yeah and it's hard to deal with that kind of stuff especially with all the the censorship and the uh the narrative steering that's going on on all those channels man you know where they just start blocking any story that doesn't go with what they want to be happening in the world it's like these tech conglomerates and these big tech companies they're highly left uh leaning highly democratic uh companies and they they want that democratic narrative pushed and they want to smash all the Republican narratives. We saw it big time in like the 2020 election. All my, I, I have friends on both sides and both in large numbers. And it was like literally all my friends that were pumping Trump and talking shit on Biden, they were just blocked, banned, banned, blocked, 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 blocked. You couldn't get anything off, not one thing that was pro Trump or anti Biden. And then all the Biden stuff was just shoved in people's faces until the 2020 election started happening. They even, uh, Amazon even shut down Parler, which was like everybody left, all the Republicans left the Facebook and the Twitters and everything, and they were like, we'll go to Parler, at least we can have freedom of speech on Parler, since freedom of speech is completely smashed all over the other uh, social media ones, and then Amazon Web Services shut Parler down 
before the election happened. Like I actually thought, on. I honestly thought shutting down Parler was dumb for the simple fact that a lot of the people who were bad actors had navigated there. Yeah. And to me, it's like if I'm trying to track these people down or keep an eye on what they're up to, I'd rather have them in a small barrel like Parler than a big barrel like uh, Facebook. Yeah. To me, I mean, like from a perspective of trying to restore order and make sure that you know what happened on the sixth didn't happen again, I would want a site like that up just so that I literally know where all these people are. Um, the thing with, um, it did, it did get put back up after the election, yeah, happened. After, they yeah, put it back up. which I mean, I figured eventually it would, I mean, that was yeah. kind of an inevitability. They with, just had to um, find somebody besides Amazon to push them. Well, and that's, and that's one thing too, is like, I think, I think in a lot of cases, I think especially with tech, I think the one area with you where I would disagree a little bit on tech is that what I've noticed on the tech side of things from talking to techies and from like talking to people who work at some of these companies, you know, who worked at some of these companies is it's not so much a political thing for them, left versus right. It really is purely money for a lot of these people. Like a lot of them, it's money. And the other thing also is techies value order. They like organization. They like, you know, they like the trains running on time, you know, and I think to a lot of techies, someone who's kind of like this, you know, hard authoritative type person who's just saying, well, this is how everything's going to be. I think that it does kind of appeal to them, especially if, you know, from an economic standpoint, he's basically saying, do whatever the hell you want um, with. And also, like the thing I also kind of observed a lot is what I noticed on Facebook that I thought was really weird. And it kind of made me wonder about it. If there was maybe like a deeper layer to it was it seemed like there were a lot of times where basically is and I know especially with women women would get like you know a temp ban or even a permanent ban for saying something that could be construed as being you know anti men or something but then they would get actual like full on like threats made against them either like in messenger or like lewd comments made about them and when they report those they'd get told oh no it's fine you know, the fact that this guy threatened to, you know, come to your house and do something bad to you is okay. That's okay. But, you know, you saying men are trash. Nope. You need 30 days to think about what you've done. Yeah. And the thing I find myself thinking about when I see stuff like that is I'm thinking, who programmed that algorithm? Was it a woman? Was it a guy? Was it a guy with a problem with women? Like, who's making these final decisions on this? Because, I mean, the thing is, like, I look at those individual things because even if it's just an algorithm making the decision – the algorithm had to be programmed by a person. There's actually a really, really, really interesting book that I recommend to people all the time called um, Weapons of Math Destruction. And it talks a lot about how algorithms are essentially used to screw people over. Yeah. Not out of a desire to be racist or to be sexist, but just because at the end of the day, the programs are designed to do one thing. They're not designed to look at individuals. Um, if I can give you a quick example of something on that. Absolutely. So let's say for the sake of argument, that at the same time, on the same day, the same crime occurs in two parts of Las Vegas. A 15-year-old kid steals a candy bar from a Circle K on North Las Vegas Boulevard in Pecos, and another 15-year-old kid steals a candy bar at the Circle K uh, across from the Sun Coast in Summerlin. Those two crimes happen at the exact same time. Same age, same race. Let's, so uh, that's one other thing too. I want to take race out of the equation entirely here because that is 100% a factor, but I want to show where the algorithm would still cause a problem. So same race, same age, same everything, same financial background, all of that. Most of the time, if these kids go to, if someone like this, if the, these two cases go to trial at the same time, it's not the judge making the final call to say, hey, you know what? This kid screwed up. I think I'm going to give him three months of community service. Or, hey, you know what? This kid's got a history of problems, and this just seems to be a symptom of a bigger problem. So maybe he needs, like, you know, a month in juvie to get his head straight. They're not even able to do that. It's basically a computer spitting out the sentence and the judge reading it half the time. And the thing is, a lot of these algorithms for sentencing are designed not based on your actual record, but based on the crime records of the neighborhood you're in. So if you happen to be in the wrong zip code and you commit the same crime as someone else, you might get a much harsher sentence than someone just because they're from the burbs and the algorithm assumes, well, this person's from North Las Vegas, this area has crime, so they're probably a career criminal or they're going to be versus, well, this is in Summerlin where crime is low, so this person probably just made a dumb mistake. That's wild. I never heard about the uh, – about 
judgment being processed through algorithm. Mm-hmm. Yep. A lot of a lot of judgments are done that way. Um, home loans are done that way. Bank loans are done that way. Like you'll get you can get denied for for a bank loan, not because you don't have good credit, but because the people in your neighborhood don't have good credit. That's wild. That and and, that, and the thing is and the, and the thing is those 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 algorithms. I don't think it's not necessarily that the person who wrote them was a bad person or racist, but they weren't thinking about the fact of who lives in these neighborhoods. And that and the thing is, again, you know, at a certain point, it stops being even being about race or about gender. It becomes entirely economics. Yeah, it becomes entirely economical. And that, I think, is something that gets lost a lot of times in the sauce. And a lot of this stuff is, you know, a lot of this stuff comes down to working class and poor people of various races, of various religions, of various backgrounds, of various lifestyles, all kind of being thrown together in this sort of fighting pit while, you know, the top 1% watches and laughs. And, or if that's not what's happening, it at least feels that way. And there needs to be a serious changes to that. No, that's definitely what's happening, bro. That's a hundred percent what's happening. They have all the money to climb anywhere. You need the money, but you need to get loans. It's just like a like a home loan, right? It's like when you're paying uh, your interest on a home loan, the first five years is like just a it's all going to interest. None of it's going into the uh, the actual payments on the houses, and then it's, and that's based on the fact that uh, most people move every four to six years. So they're like like knock it at five five years. They're not going to make any money on this house if they buy the house and then move in five years. It's just going to be all interest payments to the bank and then we'll make money and then we'll flip the house and we'll make more money and these people will never go anywhere. And unless you lock yourself in to the house for the full 30 year term, it's just not it's just not happening or you're able to pay it off early. But even if you pay it off early, then they tag you for all the interest you're going to owe across the 30 year span of the loan anyways. And you have to pay off all that interest to, pay, to complete your loan, even say if you pay it off in 10 years. It's a loaded dice game. Yeah, the whole thing's a loaded dice game. And they're, they're getting you both directions, right? You go and you earn, say, $10 an hour and they're going to take... Two dollars and fifty cents out of that ten bucks, so you have seven dollars and fifty cents left. And then you go and try to spend that seven dollars and fifty cents, and they're going to take eight nine percent of that uh, out for sales tax on top of it. You know, and it's just like uh, so you're you're winding up with you know six dollars out of your ten dollars or whatever if you're lucky. You know that you've actually earned, and so it's like where it's all just being taken left and right, left and right. Yeah, it's it's so easy to like. And that's the thing is like it really is the working class that gets nickeled and dimed to death on this stuff, because one thing is like that's one of the reasons why I've always been uh, an opponent of the whole flat tax concept, because like on paper, I understand the idea of like, well, everyone pays the same amount and it'll be fine. The thing is, though, 10 percent of someone who makes two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year versus 10 percent to someone who makes thirty thousand a year is not the same number. No. And that's and the thing is, it's not the same number. It's not the same, you know. Take, it's not the same take out of their overall expenses. Um, so it, it, so to me, it's like I mean, to me, it's like yeah, that doesn't really doesn't really work. And it's kind of the same thing, honestly, to me. Also, like I've heard, I know a lot of people propo- are proponents of like the fair tax, where it would just be like a universal sales tax, and that's all you have to pay. But again, it's like you know, if you're making you know two hundred fifty thousand a year and you're buying stuff at Walmart.com, you know, versus you know someone who you know makes ten bucks an hour and is literally going to Walmart with you know their last hundred bucks for the week to buy food for them and their kids. I mean, you know, it's like basically what they're really going to the store with a $75. And that might be the difference between, you know, their kid eating for a day or not. Yeah. So, and that's, so that's, that's, uh, that's something that I think people don't really factor in enough. Yeah. And, the, and I mean, and again, it's like the billionaires and the millionaires, you know, they're paying out the ass when it comes down to it. You know, a lot of them are up in like the 40 percentile range of the tax, you know, paying 40 percent of their income on taxes. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it's just it's it's the bulk of all the tax money we have. They're the ones funding the military and they're the ones paying out all the uh, welfare payments and everything. And it's like schmoes like you and me, maybe maybe we make six figures a year. Maybe we make just under that, you know, and it's like the the. Ten fifteen thousand dollars we're throwing out. It's just not. It's not really making this country move forward as far as like government spending and everything like that. Yeah, I mean to be fair, I mean it's like I, I'm not going to get upset at the person in front of me in line at Walmart using a snap card to feed their kid. I'm annoyed at Walmart for paying their employees so little that their employees have to go on Snap. 
Like yeah. That that to me is like there's certain areas where it's like it's it's easy for me. It's easy for people to get frustrated at someone that they can see that's like right in front of them or that, you know, that, you know, or that they feel like they can, you know, or that they feel is quite frankly, I think a lot of people like getting mad at people that they feel are at punching level. Yeah. They don't want to have to punch up because they're scared of what's going to happen, but they're willing to punch ahead or punch down because they know they can. Yeah, it's it's hard, man. And it's 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 a crazy thing to like uh, I, I was just doing a uh, fast food franchise convention and cool. uh, well, yeah, they were the, the conversations they were having were wild at this point. They uh, they're they're all pulling their hair out trying to get people to come flip burgers for them for like 15 bucks an hour up to like twenty dollars an hour. And they're just like, I can't, I'm not getting applications, man. It's, it's just, it's wild that these people won't work for this much money just to flip burgers for me. And so the, the majority of the conversations that were going on was them sharing resources on robotics and artificial intelligence stuff. And they're just like, fuck everybody then. We're just going to invest hard in R&D. And uh, over the course of the next five years, we'll make all of our money back as long as these robots pan out and they're just, and we'll have one guy running every single restaurant as opposed to a crew of people. And, you know, who cares? They let them all fucking starve if they don't want a job is basically the attitude that's coming across because they're just like, I can't pay someone more than $20 an hour to flip burgers. I'm going to have to make the burgers like 15 bucks a piece, <laughs> you know, and I'm not going to, I'm going to run my business at, into the ground. And it's like, there's just going to be no more profit margin for me to function with. I think a lot of it too, is that, you know, at a certain point, the amount of money you're offering someone to do a job almost becomes irrelevant if the job itself is unbearable. And the thing is, don't get me wrong. I mean, there, there are very well run fast food restaurants. There are great managers and franchisees that take good care of their employees. And there's also a lot that don't. And I mean, like, and I look at it from the perspective of like, okay, 20 bucks an hour. If I have a choice of spending eight hours a day on my feet around hot grease, getting yelled at by customers, getting yelled at by a manager, getting, you know, basically treated like I'm subhuman because I'm wearing a uniform and I'm supposed to serve people or spending that same eight hours in a poker room, just sitting and waiting until I go to good hand so I can try to make the same amount of money in a couple of hands and then leave. I'm going to do that every time. Not because I think I'm better than a job or that I'm above a job, but just because I'm thinking about those eight hours that I spend on my feet getting talked to that way or getting treated like that is eight hours that I'm not spending trying to book good shows or trying to, you know, do other things. Or, I mean, there's there's so many other things I could do with my time in that eight hours that's worth a lot more than one hundred and sixty dollars to me. Oh, yeah. And and that's the thing that I think a lot of employers aren't really thinking about is they're not thinking about, OK, it's not enough to say, well, you need to, you need money to live and I'm going to pay you just enough so you can do that. There has to be some sort of a get. I mean, like there has to be something there. And I mean, and another thing also is the fact that I think one of the other issues and I don't know if um, I'd be curious to see I'd be, I'd be curious to see if any of the people there commented on this, too, because I'm curious to see how much of a factor this is, is that. If you go to a fast food place now, the majority of people who work there are older. I mean, half the time when I go to a fast food place now, the person is old enough to be my dad. Yeah. And the thing is, they also have to think about the fact that, like, there's a lot of younger people who look at it like, well, OK, I'm not going to take a job unless it's at least going to be an elevated position to get me to where I really want to be long term. It's not. And I think a lot of people realize that a lot of times it's like, you know, unless you get in with the right franchisee or the right manager, that that those jobs can be Innsville. I mean, and there's a lot of there's a lot of warehouse jobs that are the same way. I mean, I was at Amazon for three years and I realized one year in that I was never going to get promoted no matter how good of a job I did. Yeah. Just because I came in at almost 30 and I came in without a degree. And that's not what they're looking for, for people to move up. They want someone who's 23 with a batch. And I totally get it. So. I mean, again, it's kind of the same thing there. the The thing with the automation stuff is, I'm curious. It's interesting that they were mentioned. They were mentioning that because my thought the last this last year was, you know, when I'm seeing all the no one wants to work anymore signs, is I'm like, well, you know, for the last three to five years, you guys have been all threatening to automate everything if people want more money. So do it. They are, and that's the thing. They're going to. Yeah, that's the thing. It's going to happen, and I think it's going to happen sooner than people think. But my question at that point, it's like, all right, fine. You know what? I don't want to make, you know, yeah, I'm not going to flip a burger for $15 an hour, but if you train me how to fix the machine for $50 an hour, I'll do it. 
and that's the thing is they're going to have to bring in people who know how to fix and maintain these machines. Well, that's all they say is there's going to be one tech that runs the machines and, and you know takes care of the systems, mm -hmm. and that's all they'll have per store is just one tech. It'll be the manager and the systems tech, and that in that position will be paying an appropriate amount of money, like a solid solid career. But see, the thing is, is I mean, there's so many people that might have a high school diploma and that's it. Yeah, you know. And they're just like, I can drink beer, beer real good, man. I fuck like a champ, you know? And it's like, those are your qualifications, huh? And it's like, yeah, you know? It's like a high, a high percentage of the population, man. They're just, you know, maybe their IQ is close to 100. Because, I mean, there's, a, there's this whole scale of it, right? So if you look at, like, the military, right, they won't take anybody below 80. And they're throwing people out a lot with that IQ below 80 level. And it's like, those people can't really do much more. But they're not; they're, these jobs are just going to disappear for those people. Yeah, there was a there was an interesting uh, article a few years back, basically talking about how as things get more and more automated, the fact that the jobs that are getting automated are the service industry jobs, and the fact that in the last twenty years, the one area in this country where jobs have actually gone up and not down is the service industry, is really disturbing because mm -hmm. what you're going to end up with twenty years from now, theoretically, is an entire class of people who basically in the eyes of the corporate world are unemployable yeah. where they can't where you know it's like you know they're going to look at you and be like well you can't do anything and at that point it's like all right well if you've got a portion of the country that literally cannot work not because they aren't willing to but just because they're being told you're not qualified i mean what do they do at that point and and that's and that's that to me is like going to be the tipping point where in like I mean, like I know a lot of people bash the. I know a lot of people don't like the whole idea of universal basic income. That's I, an inevitable. It's an inevitability. It's, it's, it's going to have to happen yeah. eventually. I'm not at a into point. it either. Like giving people money just for whatever, you know, just to be lazy fucks, because that's what eventually will happen. Is to just be this whole section of society where they just take their universal basic income, and then there'll be slum lords that go, I know everybody's getting these checks for the governments for such and such money, and they're like, I have special apartments. Give me your universal basic income check. The whole thing, you know, and uh, here's your new house and shithole part of town and it'll just like spread hard and all these people will just hang out and do nothing. And but I mean, ultimately, it's like with the social media and the online possibilities of like making money, you would hope people like take that and, and that spare time and use it to be creative and use it to like self promote and use it to grow and expand their consciousness and everything like that. But, the, you know. We, we uh, I've been on the internet a lot, and I don't see a lot of people who are interested in expanding their consciousness. You know, it's more like the hypocrisy of like "ouch my balls" and you know the toilet couch, which is just you know. I mean, people are really dumb and lazy, and and aren't interested in any of that shit. Yeah, it's it definitely is kind of going to be a thing where I mean. The thing is, I feel like the, peop the people who really fall into that category, though, I feel like they kind of weed themselves out or they kind of expose themselves over time. Um, there's definitely people, though, where I think they fall. I think there's, a, there's another category that doesn't necessarily get looked at sometimes with this, which is there's a segment of people who are willing to work, who are willing to try, yeah. but they've basically been kind of just beaten down their whole the whole time. And all they really need is one person or one thing or one opportunity to say, hey, here's a hand up, not a hand out, a hand up. And that I think is something that something like UBI could potentially be for a lot of people. I mean, at one point, a couple of years back when when uh, when Andrew Yang was proposing it, I actually went ahead and I made a post on my page saying, hey, if you were getting a thousand dollars a month every month, what would you do with it? You know, like, what would you do with it? And it was really interesting seeing the responses I got because I was kind of expecting it to be to really run the gamut from, oh, well, I'd, you know, put it towards, you know, savings or, oh, well, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd spend it on this or that. I mean, I was totally expecting people to be like, oh, I'd spend it on beer or whatever. Yeah. The majority of people that responded, the main things were they would use the money to get themselves out of debt or they would save it for a business they wanted to start. Yeah. And that to me told me, yeah, this should happen because, and the thing is to be fair, yeah, maybe I have an echo chamber and maybe, maybe I live in an echo chamber where the people responding are going to be people who are like-minded like me, but there were enough people responding that way that that kind of told me, okay, there might be something here because, I mean, I look at it from the perspective of with the amount of money that we spend 
on foreign misadventures, on, you know, on on military equipment that, you know, isn't even needed while, you know, we still have people languishing and not getting help from the VA. Or which, just sitting in Afghanistan being taken over by the Taliban. Yeah, exactly. While we have all of this going on, I'm like, you're telling me we can afford to pay for all of that, but we can't do this? Like, yeah. that. that's kind of like, or my thing is like, you know what? Do it for two years. See if it works for two years. Because two years is enough time to tell if it's really going to work or not. Well, there's been a few countries that have tried to implement it, and the, mm -hmm. the results are kind of varying as to what occurs. Uh, Interesting. I think, I think Norway had some decent results with it, and some other countries didn't really have such good results with it. Um, but it's, uh, it's ultimately, it's going to be an inevitability, man. I mean, when we start reaching 9 billion people, and, and there's... The majority of like lower IQ positions are being taken up by robotics. You know, all the warehouse jobs, uh, semi trucks are going to drive themselves. All the the franchises, like the burger franchises and everything, those are all going to operate through robotics. You're basically going to just go and do all self checkout. I mean, let's be real. That's going to be the future. You're you're going to be really surprised to see like one at this point. It's even if one yeah, register is open, that's amazing. You got a person to check out your groceries for you. That's going to be fun. Yeah, and I and I I hate self checkout. Yeah. I, I I hate that freaking thing. Like I mean, I mean, thing is like you know really you can't you can't hire some kid and pay him you know fifteen bucks an hour to bag groceries. Like come on, like you know like that, mm -hmm. like to me that's so like. When I see that in stores, that just tells me it's like it's not that you couldn't employ someone. It's that you're simply choosing not to. And it's like it's like, you know, I, it's so to me, it's just kind of lame. Like I look at that and I'm just kind of like, that's bogus. Yeah. But everything's going to go that way because ultimately it's the bottom line uh, ideology, right? It's like, how yeah. much do I make five years down the line after investing in all this robotic stuff? And it's like yeah. the initial investment's a certain amount, but five years down the line, they're going to be pulling in uh, a lot more money than they would if they had employed some kid for that five-year span and now they have to continue to employ them and possibly give them a raise and all this other stuff, right? It's like financially for the business's bottom line, it makes a lot of sense. And yeah. so, I mean, that just means it's, it is going to happen at yeah. that point, right? Because it's, it's only about the money at that point. Yeah. And I think a lot of it, too, is like, you know, especially this last year with, you know, where people are basically saying, look, I don't want to do these kind of jobs or I'm not willing to be or I'm willing to do these kind of jobs, but I'm not willing to be treated the way I was three years ago. You know, it's it's really emphasizing that this country really doesn't want entrepreneurs. It wants employees. It needs employees. But see, that's the thing, though, is like... But entrepreneurs it, are the like, lifeblood of the country. I mean, they, yeah. they really are. But it needs... They need people. And there's so many people that don't take the time to come up with the product, take the time to invest all their money and start a business and, like, risk everything. And then mm -hmm. most of the people that start businesses lose out, you know, and they have to start five businesses before one actually lands and then they can get more than two or three employees going. Yeah, I mean, Colonel Sanders wasn't a success in the mainstream sense until his mid-50s. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, like, so that's the thing is like it, there's and that's another thing too I think and you know again I keep I keep running back to social media on this but like I think social media also has a factor in this you know when I see these posts that are like oh by the time you're 30 you should have you know three times the amount of money you make per year saved for retirement and you should have this and that and this and that and I'm just like what like I mean uh. like I'm like, yeah, maybe if you're like living with your parents and they're letting you keep all your money, sure. But like, that's not how the world works. Yeah. It's like then 2008 happens and the economy collapses. Then 2020 happens and the economy collapses. And it's like, yeah, and it's like you look every at the, time, you know, yeah, all the you money you're at, saving up's gone. I mean, like you look at the look at the stock market and crypto in the past week where it's just yeah. completely cratered. I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, um, you know, and it's funny because like I get I get a lot of heat on uh, social media for not being a fan of crypto and NFTs and stuff. And like yeah. I always have people like, but what's funny to me is like no one ever actually like tries to talk to me about how they work or like to explain well hey man you're wrong because of this or that the response is always like well you're stupid or well you know you're gonna feel dumb in a few years or you know this and that it's like it's always like it, it, it's 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 like a cult like yeah. it honestly is a freaking cult at this point like i mean People maybe they're more not interested so much. in being right than having a conversation 100 percent. like that's i feel like that's kind of like you know and to me, it's like, you know, to me, it totally goes against the point of having conversations. I don't have a conversation so I can prove how right I am or so I can, you know, prove I know more than people. I have conversations so I can learn things. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, that was a big reason why I was stoked to come on the show is that I know that, you know, on a lot of things, you and I don't necessarily agree, but we can talk totally. about things. We can discuss things. And it's like, you know, and that's that's something that I think has been kind of lacking in public discourse for quite some time. Oh, yeah. And, that, you know, people just start yelling at uh, their agenda. People are, you know, it's just... 
it's really uh it's gotten to the point where people can't have any kind of conversation and like even you know out in public we'll start talking about things and uh everyone kind of inches their way into a conversation hinting at their point of view but not really solidifying it so they can backpedal real quick and not get trapped in some fucking screaming fight with somebody yeah and i see this like agitated state people are in where they're just like not especially if they're not sure who you are and what you what your opinions are about things they're just kind of like uh, i don't know you know and then, yeah uh, and then like it happened at work the other day, we started getting in like three, four of us. We all started agreeing on something and the conversation started going and then someone stepped in and go, Hey guys, you should probably stop talking about this because not everybody, you know, agrees with your opinion and we have other people in the room and it's like, you're literally not even have, allowed to have the conversation anymore. It gets shut down because people's feelings are going to get hurt and people can't stand to have their feelings fucking hurt. And it's like, get over it, man. The world isn't here to baby you, right? Like the, the it's, you shouldn't expect or feel entitled to be able to walk out into the world and have everything go hundred percent your way. That's just ridiculous and not have everybody agree hundred percent with what you think the world is, man. Yeah. There's this weird, like, I mean, and don't get me wrong. I mean, like I'm, I'm definitely like, I think one thing is that, it's hard, I think, now sometimes for me to tell with people on certain sides of the aisle if they're saying things because it's genuinely what they believe and they're just trying to get it across a certain way or they're being assertive or when they're just being mean to be mean. And that's the thing is like there's like this certain and I see this mentality on both sides of the aisle where like there's, oh, yeah. this, there's this tendency to just kind of just enjoy being mean to people or hurting people's feelings. And to me, like that doesn't really do any good because it's like. I know that if someone hurts my feelings in a conversation, like intentionally, I'm probably not going to listen to anything they have to say after that, even if it's valid, because at that point I'm like, well, you know, there's no point. If if someone's like, you know, says something that offends me in a conversation, I'm going to at least take a second to think about it and be like, all right, well, did they mean it like that? Or am I taking it the wrong way? Or but, you know, it's I think it's grown a lot harder for people to do that in day to day conversations, because I think the instinct now is to be reactive to everything. Oh, yeah. It's like it's like, you know, people want to see your response to things. And, and a lot of times people say stuff not because they're actually trying to be constructive, but just because they're trying to get a rise out of people like that whole like troll thing of like, you know, well, I'm going to say something that either has no context to the conversation or is just a shitty thing to say just so I can see if anybody responds. Like you see this in comments on news articles all the time where like, you know, there'll be an article about something and then someone will say something that's like blatantly racist or blatantly stupid just because they want to see if people respond and they want the attention. It's like it's like the equivalent of the equivalent of that kid who won't shut the hell up in class. Yeah. I mean, like at one point I said to someone you know, related to the pandemic, I said that, you know, all this, the last two years, it's felt like, you know, when, when the one kid in class won't shut the hell up and the teacher finally tears their hair out and suspends the entire school. <laughs> that's literally what it feels like. <laughs> they're, they're like the entire class has to stay because one kid screwed up. Yeah. Like that, that's literally what it feels like sometimes. Um, yeah, like with, um, yeah, it was interesting to me too with, um, with the crypto and NFT stuff because it's like, you know, what I find odd is that and don't get me wrong, I, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not a financial advisor. People should invest in whatever the hell they want. It's their money. But I look at it like this. I'm like, does anyone else find it odd that our generation, like people like our age and younger, are being told, oh, you should invest in digital land. You should invest in digital coinage. You should invest in digital art. Meanwhile, all the people who are older than us who actually have money, they're buying fine art. They're investing in stocks. They're investing in actual tangible things. They're investing in precious metals, things like that. They're buying land, like physical land. They're buying franchises, things like that. And I look at that and I find myself thinking, okay, is, is this really because this is the new future of money? Or is this because what they're really trying to do is make sure they don't lose anything they've already got to the next generation? It, it feels like a giant grift is honestly what it feels like to me. Well, I mean, everybody's allowed to play ball, man. And, yeah. you know, there's uh, there's just the opportunity that comes with the uh, the Bitcoins and the uh, Ethereum and all that, right? All this cryptocurrency is that it's taking the power out of the hands of the government, right? Because it's like all of our money right now, it doesn't function on like a gold standard or anything like that anymore, right? It's this fiat money. It's, yeah. it's just like promissory notes under good faith. 
that you know that this money will remain a certain value level right and it's like then the government shits its pants like it's done in the last year and it starts inflation tactics and it starts just printing money and screwing up the value of the dollar and now any dollars that you have sitting in a safe or whatever that aren't accumulating interest it's just like the value of that just dissipates it keeps dropping and dropping and dropping because of the government's own incompetence and so the the cryptocurrency it really gives us the opportunity to take that power back as as a civilization and so the power lies in the in people's faith in the value of the crypto as opposed to the government being able to get their hands on it back and forth right and so it's it, it's worth what we say it's worth and it's not worth what the government says it's worth and that's the big deal for me with the crypto is is it's all about taking power away from the government as far as i'm concerned smaller government less power the government has the more freedom we have and uh and and crypto is definitely a good way of going in that direction uh and also it's in its infancy right and nothing's ever escalated as fast as crypto has escalated like in the history of mankind no currency basis has ever uh, escalated as fast as this has and so it's a huge opportunity right now to get in still when it's basically ground floorish i mean it's not ground floor right you can't buy bitcoins for a penny and then they're going to be worth seventy thousand dollars again or you know a lot of these people say it's going to end up being hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars per bitcoin by the time all the mining's done because there's a, there's only a finite amount of bitcoin right yeah once that's done it's just going to increase in value because with, of scarcity um, yeah with with it's interesting because I, the, the the comparison i hear a lot of times is a lot of people compare crypto and nfts to you know the birth of the internet in the sense of saying like well you know the first few years of the internet you know no one knew what it was going to do people kind of just dismissed it as like a hobby thing and now it's so mainstream and ingrained in everyone's lives and I can see that to an extent, and the thing is, the, 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 my issue with my my issue and concerns with with crypto is has nothing to do with the tech. I find the tech fascinating. I actually I'm I'm always interested in learning about that stuff. Where I find myself weirded out by it is one thing is that you know when it when it first came out, the big selling point you know like a decade back when people were initially talking about it was oh well this is money that can't be traced. The thing is, if it's on a blockchain, it's public knowledge you can literally look at the blockchain and see that like you know this person spent x amount on this and x amount on that yeah i mean the thing is the only person someone the only way someone's going to actively know that about my personal bank account or if i buy something in cash is if i tell them if i buy something with crypto literally everyone in their mom's going to know if they feel like doing the research so that to me kind of defeats the purpose of that if what you're wanting is privacy um but the other thing also that i find myself really worried about is that the the mentality people tend to have in the crypto community towards like the pump and dump stuff. Yeah. Because every time one of these things happens, um, and they happen frequently, the response I see from people in the crypto community online isn't, man, this sucks. We got to keep this shit from happening because it's making us look bad. It's, well, you shouldn't have gotten ripped off or haha, sucks to suck. That, that literally seems to be the mentality is like, you know, well, if you get ripped off, that's not our problem. And that's an immature troll talking, man. Exactly. Pay attention in the market. Yeah. See, and that's and that's the thing is it's like, you know, if you invest in stock market, it's going to do the same thing. Yeah. They do that to the stocks. hundred percent. I what, mean, you know what happened with GameStop, right? Yeah. I mean, what, well, the, the, the crazy thing with that was it was like I loved that whole situation because it was basically yeah. them playing the hedge funds at their own game. Yeah. But, you know, the thing that's very telling to me is that the minute Wall Street bets and a lot of these sites started getting like mainstream publicity, it seemed to me like, or, and I noticed this too on, I noticed this on the forum, on the Wall Street bets forums a lot in the last six, several months, is that it seemed like a lot of people kind of started getting turned off by it because it seemed like a lot of the stuff that was getting proposed on there or, or pushed on there wasn't legitimate. It was stuff that basically was like designed to get that kind of, you know, quick pump and dump action. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and the thing is like, that's been around since the market. What it does weird me a lot out a little bit that people like Jordan Belfort, who is an admitted con artist, thinks crypto is so great because it's like you know, that, that to me is kind of a bit of a red flag. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I, I think the tech has absolute legitimacy. And I do think especially especially Ethereum, where it, you know, it, it has less of an environmental impact than Bitcoin does. And it's a lot faster. Um, and the thing is, I do think that there's definitely merit to the smart contract concept. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that that's going to be something that, you know, is definitely mainstream down the line. But I do think that. I think people are probably I think I think right now it's probably in that like 
for lack of a better term, that Pets.com era of like, you know, that 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 period of time between 98 and 2000 where everything had a website and everyone thought dot com stocks were going to be the thing. And then it was kind of like the bottom kind of fell out of it. And the thing is, the people who were legitimate did rise up after that. But I think it's going to probably be I mean, it would not surprise me at all if we see like another two or three cycles like this where it gets really big and then it drops and it gets really big and it drops before we kind of see some sort of stability. But that's another thing, too. I don't necessarily know what the definition of stability in the crypto market is. That's Nobody something does. That, yeah, exactly. And that, that to me is a little bit, that's kind of scary to me too as an investor because, yeah. I mean, like if I put money into, you know, if I put money into the S an S&P 500 fund or if I put money into like a certain ETF, I can usually track that and say, hey, well, it's done this the last five years. I know what these industry trends are. It might, you know, do this. It might do a little better. It might do a little worse. With crypto, it's really a lot harder to tell because, I mean, for one thing, it's like, I mean, there you've got you got countries like El Salvador that are wanting to use it as their main currency, and then you got countries like China that just want to ban it outright because, yeah. again, and I totally get why China wants to ban it because they don't want to seek that kind of control to people ever. That's not no, what they're, they're about. They're not letting people. China just doing amazing shit right now. Like they're they're completely changing their whole society around, right? So like mm -hmm. people are limited on internet usage time. They're limiting people's game time. Like they're just like shutting people's consoles off, shutting people's phones off. They're like social media. You're not uh, like I think all the social media networks that they have in China shut down at like eleven or something like 996 that. Nine nine six culture. Yeah, it's like completely like we don't want you engaging in this manner. They recognize that it's an unhealthy way to um, utilize your consciousness. And they're just like, we, we got to stop that shit from happening to our people because they see what's happening to fucking us, right? We're just, we're turning into a disaster. I guess my question then on that, though, is like, at what point does, because like, I mean, I look at it, I mean, I, mean, I guess I guess when I started seeing like some of the restrictions and stuff they were putting on, it kind of weirded me out because I found myself thinking like, I mean, first off, if they ever tried to do that in this country, people would full out riot. I mean, oh, yeah. people would lose their mind. Yeah. But again, you know, it's. It's also a much different mentality there. You know, the mentality in that part of the world and a lot of other parts of the world is, you know, things are about the collective, about the greater good. America's never been that way. We've always been about, you know, individual freedoms, individual risk, individual, you know, whatever. And I think that was something that I think people really underestimated when the pandemic started was the fact that, you know, most most societies, yeah, you can tell people, hey, this is a public health issue. It's for the greater good. And people would go along. You ask anyone to do anything in this country. And the first question is why? Yeah. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a uniquely American thing. But, you know, it's it's a much different ask from any other part of the world, I think, in that sense. I mean, it. Um, but uh, the other thing also is like. I looked at, you know, China not wanting to use Bitcoin. Well, like I said, I understand why. I also saw them not wanting to use crypto as a bit of a red flag because at the end of the day, they control the majority of trade. Yeah. Well, and they control their country with an iron fist. I mean, they just, they control all the information that comes in and out of the country, right? Like all yeah. the things that like, are you familiar with like what Disney does with their movies and everything going to China and how yeah. Hollywood like panders to China really hard. Oh yeah, they, they edit movies down. I mean yeah. they I mean God they filmed they filmed Mulan in an area of the country where they harvest people's organs. Yeah. Like they literally filmed it down the street from a labor camp. Really? I didn't know that. That's crazy. Yeah, there's um there's been a lot of evidence that um, there are certain minority groups in uh, like minority Muslims and some other groups, uh, like and groups like Falun Gong in China where they basically there's there's allegations that they basically use them for harvesting. Well, yeah. I mean, that's a the black I mean, market organ industry is a is a real thing. I mean, yeah. anything you can think of, it's been done, and it's been done to the extremest level it can possibly be done. I mean, this is the the, the world of possibilities, man. This planet of Earth of ours, man. You know, humans will do everything and anything they can possibly do. With um, it was it was crazy. With um, like there was an article that came out last year that I remember some of my friends being shocked by, where it was saying that there's more people living in slavery now than there has been in any time in the history of the world. Yeah. And people were saying, well, how is that possible? And I'm like, you're not thinking about it in terms of the world. You're thinking about it in terms of your your country or your personal view. I'm like, yeah. you're not thinking about where the things that make up the components of the things you use come from. You're not thinking about where the lithium in your lithium ion batteries comes from. You're not thinking about where, you know, the where the cocoa beans in your chocolate bar comes from. You're not thinking about those things because we've been ingrained not to. We They don't want you thinking about that stuff because the minute you think about it and you start worrying about it, that affects your spending. Yeah. 
Um, and also the fact that with the internet, we have the ability to track these things now. We have the ability to learn these things. Like, that's one thing, like, you know, the whole, like, you know, a lot of the anti-vax stuff with people saying, well, vaccines cause autism and stuff because, you know, well, we have more people with autism, diagnosed with autism now than we've ever had. And I'm like, that's because we know what to look for. Yeah. You know, 100 years ago, if you were autistic, basically you were locked up unless you had some sort of like, you know, unless you could like work and then they would just make you work till you died doing something. I mean, that's not that's not fixing the problem. And, you know, and it's like now it's like now we have a much better understanding of what it actually is. And and the thing is, and I'll fully admit, I'm not an expert on the stuff at all. There's a lot of research I need to do and a lot more understanding that I need to do. But again, to me, it's like, you know, I look at that and I think, OK, well, if it's not a matter of like something artificially happening that's making this worse, it's that we're more aware of what it is and we know what to look for. But that gets spun as, you know, this grand conspiracy. And that's I think a lot of the. A lot of the conspiracy stuff that pops up online, too. I think a lot of that just stems from people really not not wanting to look at the most base possible reason for something and accept it at face value of saying, yeah. like, well, maybe it's this way because people are greedy or maybe it's this way because, you know, people are shitty or maybe it's this way because, you know, there's an economic interest for someone to keep it this way. You know, there's always like it's usually money. Oh, 100 percent. Money is pretty much 99 percent of the time. It boils down to that. Yeah. Everything is just everything is just money and power, man. You know, but yeah, it's 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 amazing what people can come up with, though, the conspiracy theories and the cult culture that develop around it, man. It's just wild. I think it's uh, hilarious, too. And it's like people are so easily led to any of these things and they want to think that the world is something more than it is they want an excuse they want this victimhood mentality and they want this 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 you know like oh it's everybody else's fucking fault you know and then to just go like well people are out there making money and they're going to trample all over wherever they have to trample all over and you really don't mean that much in the world your life is pretty meaningless the only thing that gives it meaning is you and no one cares. You're just a number. You're just a social security number. And as long as you keep paying your fucking taxes, they won't throw you in a cage, right? It's like, but uh, the yeah, the conspiracy theories is like the flat Earth people, right? Like the flat yeah. Earth people blow me away, man. And uh, and there's just so much evidence against it, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They want to feel like there's this this greater force going on around them, man. That is that they know for a fact that they're right and and it's, it goes back to that whole thing about people want to know that they're right and they want to know that they know something that nobody else knows and that makes them feel special yeah definitely that that definitely plays out a lot and i think um i think also you know i think ironically having so much access to information i think has given people the mistaken impression that they know more than they actually do yeah i feel like the older i get i mean i'm I'm 36 now, and I mean, I feel like the older I get, the the more I realize how much I don't know and how much I really do need to research. There's things that I thought I knew that, you know, I had to relearn in the last couple of years. There's things that I didn't know in the last couple of years that I had to reeducate myself on. I mean, especially in 2020, I did so much deep diving into things just because I had the time. And it made me realize just how much stuff, I mean, like, I mean, especially like, you know, with everything that was going on last summer, um, with everything, I found myself realizing how much American history I really wasn't taught. Yeah. And how much I really didn't know about this country. And that, and not in the sense of like, you know, wanting to be angry or ashamed, but in the sense of just wanting to know so that this stuff doesn't happen anymore. Wanting to know so this stuff doesn't happen nice. again. And that's, and that's, and that, that to me is the scariest part about it is that, you know, now there's this big push to like not teach people things like like the, in Tennessee, they just banned the book Mouse from the library because it has because it has harsh language. I'm like, you're banning a book about the Holocaust because it says the word damn in it. Like uh, when you when your school has active shooter drills, like, come on, like at a certain point, it's like, you know, you're just at a certain point. It just makes no sense to me. Yeah. And and also, I mean, you know, the whole thing of like. To me, it's like if someone's not wanting something like that to be taught, it's not out of a motivation of not wanting to upset people. It's because they don't want people to remember. And at that point, that's when I really start questioning people's motivations. That's when, like, you know, the gears start turning in my head to, like, why are you really pushing this narrative or wanting to not tell people this? 
Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, then that, cause I mean like, I mean like, I mean like if I had, a, if I, if I was a parent, if I was a parent with a kid in that school, I'd immediately pulled my kid out. I'd been like, no, this is bullshit. I wouldn't send my kid to public school at this point at all. I'd re, I'd re, remodel my whole life and my I career so, bad so for I could kids homeschool now. people. Or I feel so bad for kids. kids now. Yeah, no, it's insane what they're being pushed in, in schools, man, and, like, over-sexualized and, like, over racism. you know? Like, everything's racism and everything's sexuality, and it's just fucking wild, man. It's like preschoolers don't need to be taught about sexuality, man. You know, like, why are you forcing that shit into their brains? And everything's not racist, you know? Like, there's things that aren't, and white people aren't all evil, and black people aren't going to just be fucked their whole lives. You can't just tell black kids they're not going to make anything of themselves because their skin is black and everything's against them. It's like, that's not how you encourage people to grow, man. That's fucked up. You're like giving people mental complexes and, and perceiving the world and all kinds of fucked up views, man. And it's like there's a lot of love in this world still. And it's just people's perceptions of it that it just skews everyone's mind into shit. You know, and it's just they're just trying to force this agenda on our children, man. And it's it's wild to me that it has any place in school. Kids, kids nowadays really have it tough. I mean, it's like you've got I mean, the biggest thing I, I think one of the biggest one of the biggest factors for kids now is that we remember a time before the Internet. We remember a time before social media. So we don't have that like I mean, yeah, we need it for promoting and we need it for marketing things and we need it for, you know, connecting with family. But we don't see it necessarily as like something we absolutely positively have to have or something that we're obligated to. This generation now that's grown up with social media in their life, their entire life, they're tethered to it. They can't get away from it if they want to. Oh, yeah. And that's scary because it's like, I mean, it's an addiction. Know, yeah. And it's like, you know, there's there's this there's this attitude of like, and what's very telling to me is like, I think it's so, I, I get so frustrated with people now when like, you know, when there's like anti-bullying campaigns and people try to be like, oh, bullying's always been around, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, except I remember growing up in the 90s and 2000s when there was bullying, but the problem was basically it was like, okay, you know, a kid bullies you and hits you and you hit them back. You both get suspended. You both get in the same amount of trouble, even though you were defending yourself. And what that basically does is that teaches kids one of two things, either A, don't fight back and take it for your entire life because that's all you're going to do, or B, it tells you hit someone before they hit you and then all of a sudden you're the bully and then all of a sudden you're lashing out at anyone that you even think is a threat. It's like, and it's like we basically in that through that process of the 90s and 2000s, I feel like we basically created an entire generation where it's like. Half of us can't leave the house without a Xanax and the other half of us want to fight anyone who looks at us wrong. Yeah. And I will say that I do think that the younger generation does the one thing that I really hope does happen is I hope they can look at millennials as a whole and kind of learn from the mistakes both that we made and the things that were done to us in the sense of, you know, they know at least those kids now know the game is rigged. We were raised to say, well, the game might or might not be rigged, but it's really important you play anyway. And I feel like there's a lot of people like in our age group where they're still kind of waiting and hoping that someone's going to come along and just kind of fix stuff. No. And, and it's Personal not going to and, and, and that's man. the thing. The next generation knows that. They know that yeah. going in. They know that no one's coming to save them. So they got to do it themselves. Yeah. And I mean, like that's that's especially like, you know, when I'm on socials and like when I'm on like things like TikTok and I hear like, you know, college age kids talking about, you know, where they see the world going and their worldview. That's the vibe I definitely get is it's like it's not, you know, that they're expecting it's not that they're expecting the world to, you know, capitulate to them. And then that's not that they're expecting the world. They're not, they, it's not that they feel entitled. It's almost like the opposite. It's like they know they're going to have to claw for everything they want. So they're basically kind of saying, okay, that's what we're doing and don't expect us to be nice about it. You shouldn't be nice. Business isn't nice. It's never been nice. And working for people is not a nice thing. And like, that's why I, I do independent contracting work. I'm not loyal to anybody, right? Like I just, I, and I'm blatantly honest about that. I have no loyalty. I'm here to make money for me and my family. That's it. And the only person I'm concerned about is 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 my family 
and paying the IRS because so I don't get thrown in a fucking cage. That's it. So who's got the most money for me, right? I'm going to go work for them today. And whoever else has more money next week, I'm going to go work for them. And that's it. That's the end of it, man. You know, we're not friends. We don't have to be buddies. You yeah. know, I'll be really nice about like uh, personal interactions and everything like that. But when it boils down to it, you know, it's like, no, I'm not holding out so that I can make sure my schedule is open for you. I'm not committing to your company because you're making all the profits. Right. Like where's, you know, all my hard work's going to make all you, uh, uh, your business, make all your profits. You're going to keep all the profits and you're giving me as little as possible. So unless I go out there and I just hustle and I go, fuck everybody, uh, I'm a really good at this thing that you need done and I'll take this much money, please. You know, and that's it. And if you don't have it, I'll go to fucking someone who does. And it's just, it just needs to be more like that, man, where people are willing to negotiate for their rates and fight for what they know they're worth and make themselves a useful tool. That's the other thing that's really important is people think that they they graduate from high school and they know they're bitching, you know, and all their friends online say they're bitching. And so it's like, uh, yeah, man, it's it's uh, uh, why am I not the manager of this company yet? I know fucking better than everybody else in the whole goddamn world, you know, and it's like, well, nobody gives a shit about you, man. No one ever will give a shit about you. No one cares about me. No one cares about you. No one cares about anybody but them fucking selves and how much money they can make. And so you make yourself a useful tool. You make yourself the most valuable asset that these people can come to. And then, it, you know, shit will work out in your favor. But it's like people want shit to just go their way without the whole process of making themselves a valuable tool and doing all the studying and doing all the hard work and gaining all the experience and eating the giant buckets of shit it takes to get to that level. Yeah, I mean, um, I it would be amazing if we could be valued as human beings just for existing. But I mean, realistically, our society values people if you yeah. provide something. Yeah, I mean the the American dream, to be honest, isn't life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness anymore. It's finding something you like to do and getting someone to pay you for it. Yeah, that's honestly what it is now. Yeah. Well, then George Carlin said it the best. You know, they call it the American dream because you have to be asleep to believe it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's yeah, it's just it's a harsh world out there, man. And it's never going to get nice. Like that's just not real, man. Everyone's going to be fighting and clawing and taking advantage of anything. It's like online gaming is a great example of that, especially things that are getting updated all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like this constant process of like PvP and uh, and like. Uh, all in warfare people start testing the walls and the boundaries and they're like oh new update where can I fucking take advantage of everything and like manipulate the system and like I'm gonna just fucking cheat 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 and who cares they didn't write the code good enough that's their fucking problem not my problem I'm gonna cheat this system I'm gonna win all the points and that's all they do and that's why the laws are so excessive and out of control right and there's fucking just giant mountains of law books because Every single one of those laws is written because someone figured out a way to cheat the system or a new way to do something to manipulate human beings, and they had to write another law about it, put new yep. rules in place, and constantly people are poking every single boundary they can poke. Yeah, and not to mention, I mean, a lot of those laws are written to not to protect people. They're written to protect commerce, pure and foremost, and yeah. a lot of those laws are written to protect authority. They're not written to protect the people. I mean, you know, I look at, like, I mean— I mean, I'm, I'm of the opinion that if a, if a crime punishment is strictly a fine and not anything else, basically what you're saying is that's a crime for poor people. Because, yeah. yeah, you know, you tell a rich person, hey, you know, you pissed on the sidewalk, that's, you know, a thousand dollar fine. They're going to be like, whatever you tell, you know, you know, you tell some drunk person, you know, oh, you pissed on the street, that's 10 grand, you know, that. Or, you know, you give someone a traffic ticket. I mean, how many people do you know who've had like an entire year of their life upended because of a traffic ticket? Because, you know, or because like all it takes is like one thing going wrong. Yeah. That's something that I think a lot of people really underestimate with the economy is that there are a lot of people in the middle class who are literally in the middle class hanging on to a cliff by their teeth. Yeah. And all it's going to take is one thing going to shit for them to for the bottom to fall out. I mean, you know, it, I mean, you know, I mean, I remember like, you know, in high school, my mom, you know, fell and broke her elbow. And I mean, I think financially that set that set her back like a year and a half. Because, you know, when you get because in this country, if you're poor and you get hurt, that's what it does to you. Yeah. Or if you get sick, that's what it does to you. And that's, you know, I think not enough people factor that in and also our safety net 
as a country is not designed well enough to prepare people for those things. Um, and the thing is, I do think there should be a safety net. I don't think anyone should, you know, like I, I it, it bothers me so much when I see like, you know, these like and, you know, I hate to, you know, go on another tangent here, but like. I, uh, it bothers me so much when I see like these articles, you know, where it's talking about like, you know, well, you know, the schools, not, you know, make kids, you know, not not let kids eat if they don't have money for lunch or whatever, or this like that, or like the school made this kid give his lunch back and stuff. And I'm like, really? I'm like, like, y you can't just feed the damn kid. Like, I mean, it's not the kid's fault that his parents have problems. It's not. And that's the thing. That's my biggest thing. I don't think any kid in this country should suffer because their parents can't or won't take care of them. It's not the kid's fault. Yeah. Once they're once they're eighteen, yeah, they got Then yeah, they're an adult and they got to do their own thing. But no kid should have to you know not eat because their parent forgot to give them lunch money or because their parent couldn't give them lunch money. That this idea that like you know, yeah, that's like that to me is the one area where I feel like people need to be a lot more compassionate and a little less selfish. But I mean, yeah, if we're talking about adults, you know, yeah, you know, there's a certain level of, you know, personal responsibility comes into play. But I mean, like, like when I read like comments like, you know, well, you know, I guess it sucks for that kid ha, 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 or whatever. It's just like, dude, come on. Like who raised you? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. And and the well, whole like, and, and you're right, like, you know, the world, you know, the world isn't a nice place, but I definitely think that there's nothing wrong with, you know, individual niceness in the sense of like, you know, my thing is like, I mean, the, the, someone said something to me at one point at a previous job of mine. He was like, I can't teach nice. No. And that's hundred percent true. Like people either have that in them or they don't. Well, and, uh, that's your natural state of being, honestly, man. Like, uh, my Zen master said a great, great way. Uh, I was, I was listening to some other things about compassion and building compassion and this and that. And, uh, and he says, uh, Compassion is your natural state. You can't build compassion. You can't work on your compassion. You are compassion. And what's happening is there's all this bullshit in front of it that you need to clear out of the way. All your ego and your sense of self and your, your sense of self-righteousness and your depression, your attitude, your illusions about the world, man. And if you can start cleaning that mess up that you've created that that you think is you you can get to that sense of love and compassion underneath it all and then you're just love and compassion it's not it comes effortlessly because you're not entwined with this physical world and the sense of self that uh ultimately brings about all your suffering right and brings about all this like Oh, but me, I need, I want, I, I deserve this and things should be this way and things shouldn't be this way. And it's all just fucking bullshit, you know? And there's just really, when it comes down to it, the core of both of us, man, is just this loving awareness that's full of compassion, man. But it's the sense of self and the desire to cling to everything and fulfill our own needs that gets in the way of all that and when things get in the way you then you'd be rude to people or if things aren't going your way you don't know how to deal with them because you're not practicing any kind of mindfulness exercises you're lost in this ego thing and you think that this is just all there fucking is is this physical world and uh and that really is what i see a lot of is most people's biggest issue is that they're so caught up in themselves and their own desires that the rest of the world is just this blur in front of them that's getting in their way. Yeah, there's that's definitely very true. A lot of people, I think a lot of people just kind of go barreling through their day to day life, not really kind of with blinders on to everything that doesn't involve them and what they specifically need. And I, I can understand that, especially I can understand that to some extent. I mean, there's definitely been times in my life where I was that way. Oh, me too. I mean, I mean, I think that's kind of just human nature in a lot of respects. But I think that um one thing I've noticed, though, especially in the last few years, was it seemed like a lot when I when I've talked to people in the last few years, especially people who are angry about the way things are, you know, whether it's the country or whatever on either side, it's like a lot of them, you know, a lot of them, the anger roots from the fact that they were sold a narrative that isn't true, which is that on either side, which is that, you know, if you do this and that and this and you play by the rules and you do what you're supposed to do, you're going to be fine. And. People on the right are told that at birth. People on the left are told that at birth. And it's not true. Yeah. Unfortunately, the, it's not. It's, the government does not have your best interest in mind. No. No. I mean, nobody does. Nobody does. I mean, the only person who's going to have your best interest in mind is you and hopefully your family and hopefully your partner if you have one. Like, that's, that's yeah. pretty much, you know, 
that's pretty much who you got. <laughs> um, and, you know, and like you were saying, it's like, you know, that's one of the, the thing with being an independent contractor that's great is, you know, you can go into things and you're not getting sold this like this, like, you know, corporate line of like, we're a family and, you know, yeah. we're all in this together. It's like, no, we're here to do a job. Yeah, that's I mean, it. Let's let's do the job. Let's get paid and we'll all go home. Yeah, I'll pay our bills. I can buy some food this week, right? Yeah, exactly. It's not, you know, like this. Like that's that's, and I think that's also another reason why, to to an extent, I think that also may be a contributing factor to why a lot of people are hesitant to go back to work. I think, mm-hmm. I think there's definitely more things at play than simply, you know, people not wanting to work or wanting more money. I think there's there's a lot of things in the sense of like, you know, I mean, like this whole i mean personally i'm of the opinion that if you're a for-profit business you should not be allowed to use the words family or community in any mission statement or corporate <laughs> statement ever because yeah, y'all man. don't know what those words mean you're they're lying <laughs> yeah like the last 10 years it's like you know anytime i heard a project locally be like oh well this is community based or it's about the community i my immediate like my bullshit flag immediately goes up it because should. i'm like because i'm like what community are you talking about man like it's like because it's like you know at the end of the day it's a for-profit venture you're not a community service you're not you know this isn't the national endowment for the arts like yeah don't pretend to be something you're not um but that's how they get more money and more people yeah. doing it and oh you know can't you do it for you know just do it for like 10 bucks an hour instead of 15 i can't really give you 15 bucks an hour you know what i mean and it's yeah. just like Oh, I can't really waste my fucking time with you then, bud. Yeah, and, I can't and if really. that's the response. Yeah, I can't really feed my family this week. So kind of yeah, a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, and then like the whole thing with, um, yeah, like the whole thing with like the whole like we're a family thing. Like, I mean, you know, I, I find it so funny that like the companies that spout that crap are the same ones that are wanting you to, you know, stay extra hours without pay. They're the ones that want to dock your pay. They're the ones that want to, you know try to screw with your check because you said something that made them upset. It's like, it's like, you know, they're not saying when they say we're a family, what they're saying is we're an abusive family simulator. Yeah. <laughs> like, they'll fire your ass like that, man. They do not care. You know, yeah. You're I mean, dispensable. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, we're a right to get fired state. So it's yeah. like, you know, why would you subject yourself to that? I mean, I mean, the thing is like, I've, I've been independent. I've done the corporate thing. I've done them both. I've gotten a lot out of both. I've enjoyed both. I've met amazing people on both sides of it. But at the end of the day, I'm definitely a lot happier working for me. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, it's nice being able to, you know, say that the buck stops entirely with me. If something's a problem, I take ownership and I fix it as opposed to having to send it up a ladder, hope it gets fixed or, you know, and the other thing also is I think and this is something that I do think factors into the whole like entrepreneur versus employee thing with with the mindset is I think there are some there are a lot of people and I find this mostly in the corporate world where they what they really want is middle management. What they they they, they won't say that's what they want, but what they really want is that because yeah. what they want is to be in a position where they can punch down on people and make people do things for them, but they don't want to be in a position of so much authority that if things go wrong, they have to be the one to clean it up. They want to be yeah. able to shoot it up the ladder. Like it's kind of one of those like, you know, you know, they want to be able to, you know, boss around the people under them, but then the minute anything actually gets hard, they want to be able to send it up to their manager or their director. And I've never really understood that mentality. I'd rather just have the buck stop with me entirely. Yeah. Well, the least amount of responsibility with the most amount of income would be the preferred situation. Well, right? yeah. I mean, that's the thing. <laughs> of course. I mean, like, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, um, so it, and, and I think, I think, you know, especially when, I think especially in the last few years, I've been wanting that because, you know, I want to have that ability to say yes when other people say no. Yeah. And I also want to have the ability to say no when everyone's telling me to say yes. Yeah. And when you're working for someone, you can't really do that all the time. Um, And the thing is, there's definitely challenges that come with it in the sense that, like, I think a lot of people assume that when you're an independent contractor, that means you can just kind of, you know, like, be as abrasive as hell with everyone and you don't have to get along with people. And it's quite the opposite. You have to get along with everybody at that point. But the thing is, you have to get along with everybody, but you also have to have boundaries. And I think that's the toughest thing for people to do is, I mean, like, even like, I mean, even like, you know, talking to friends of mine who are looking for work. I remember one of my friends being like, I have this interview coming up in a week. I'm really, really nervous because I know they're going to be asking me a bunch of questions. And I was like, you understand you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you, right? 
I was like, this isn't a police interrogation. You're not going in there to get questions barked at you that you have to answer. You're going in there. They're going to ask you questions, answer them honestly, and then have questions to ask them. Ask yeah. them things. Ask them things that are going to make them uncomfortable. Tell them how much you want. Yeah. Don't, don't ask them. You don't ask people, how much are you going to pay me? You go, this is how much I charge for my services. Yep. And that's how you get your money. Otherwise, people are going to pay you the bare minimum they can possibly get away with paying you, man. And that's one of the problems I have with fucking minimum wage is we don't teach people how to negotiate a contract, man. They just go, well, the government says that this is an acceptable rate. Oh, that's like 100% by design. They don't want people knowing how to negotiate. not an acceptable rate. Yeah, I know yeah, it is. Yeah, I know it, it is. Yeah. It's just like how they don't teach you how to do your fucking taxes or pay your bills or fucking plan for your leg to get broken, right? It's yeah. like you should be living in a certain place where you're not just barely keeping, you know, that's living above your means whenever if you, if one thing happens to you and it sets your entire life back, it's like you don't have that extra like five, ten grand sitting off to the side of like, oh shit, money. You should step down one fucking notch, man. Cancel your Netflix subscriptions, get a smaller house, maybe don't fucking have a $700 a month car payment to drive a fucking Mustang around. And, you know, it's like be able to put away enough money for oh shit times and like know how to fucking do all these things. These yeah. are these is like being an adult, but no one teaches anybody any of this shit, man. You know? Yeah, and plus, I mean, the system's kind of set up to where it's like once you're in it, you're kind of locked in. It's like, you mm -hmm. know, once once you're... Once you're at a point where you're having to rely on certain levels of assistance or certain subsidies, you get kind of stuck there because you're put in a position where it's like, I mean, you get put in a position where it's like, okay, well, if I give these things up, you know, yeah, I can make it into the next income thing, but then I'm going to lose this help, but I'm not going to get any other help. So I'm going to be in as bad a position or even worse. And the, the system is not set up in a way for people to succeed and it's really unfair it's it's yeah. it's, it's it's and it's it's you know it's it's and you brought up a really good point it's like i mean i don't think i mean like contract negotiation the only reason i know how to negotiate contracts is because i book concerts for a living and i've been doing it since i was 19 and 20. that was not something i was taught in high school that's not yeah. something i was taught in college yeah that's that's something that basically you learn if you either a get in a job that requires it or b you know your parents teach you and I mean, and it's like which they should be teaching you. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I was very fortunate. I mean, I grew up with a mom who was an, who was a lawyer who had experience dealing with contracts who was willing to show me things. But again, you know, I'm hundred percent admit I'm coming from a place of privilege in that sense. You know, I had access to resources, if not money, at least time and you know, and knowledge that a lot of people don't have. Yeah, and I'm very grateful for that. And that's I something just got that, screwed over a bunch until I was like, I need to start doing this different. <laughs> that honestly, I think is how it happens for most people. I mean, yeah. the thing that the thing that I feel bad about is you get those people where they get screwed over a bunch of times, and then they either figure, well, that's the way it's going to be, and they kind of check out. Yeah, and they kind of just figure, well, that's the way it's going to be, or I'm going to take it. Or they get screwed over enough times that they, again, kind of go the opposite route where it's like they want to be the one doing the screwing. So yeah, suddenly, to be. so then they turn into exactly what they were dealing with before. <laughs> and, and to me, there's definitely a balance of like, you know, being assertive and saying, hey, you know, this isn't all right, but also not not necessarily using that position in a way to like, you know, push things, push people around. And that's and that's kind of, you know, that's something that, you know, I think. I feel like people in authority need to be a little bit more cognizant of. Like, I think there's too much of a mentality sometimes of like, all right, well, you know, once I'm in a position of power, I'm going to make all these people who, you know, made me feel bad, feel twice as bad. And I'm like, yeah. I don't care about that. I just want to get shit done. That's an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Right yeah. There, like man. I'm not like, that's my thing is like, you know, success to me is not going on some sort of revenge tour. Success no. is working my ass off and succeeding that's and you should be helping people man yeah 100 like every I mean, step up i take in my career and in my life i'm always reaching back down and going hey man how about a leg up bud yeah because I, I didn't get here because no one was reaching down for me people are helping me do this stuff people are teaching me how to negotiate better rates and, and helping me do these things and it's like and and that reciprocal process of man paying it forward is really important whenever you anytime you take one step up the ladder you know you should always turn around and take yeah. your immediate family or your, some of your closest friends with you man yeah I because think, that's how we all grow 
Yeah, I mean, like, it doesn't, you know, it's like, I, there's no point in making it to the penthouse if you're not sending the elevator back down. Yeah, it's like that one guy who fucking made all that money. I, I it does, It's a, just a totally random story. But, uh, yeah, and he gave all of his friends, like, a million dollars each because he had nobody to party with. And he's like, and I don't need to be just paying for everybody, and I want to live this lifestyle, but I don't have anybody I like living the lifestyle with me because, fuck it, all my friends are millionaires now. That's fucking rad. I don't need it. And it makes everybody's life better, you know, including his life. You yeah, know? it's like, super cool. So, yeah, I mean, it's like if we can, we can all do that for each other. But it's like, it's not like the government's responsibility or your job's responsibility. It's, it's your circle. It's your community. It's like you got to tend your own garden. There's only, yeah. there's a small circle of people that you can love and take care of and help lift, uh, lift up in the world. And in turn, they should be helping lift you back up. And, you know, it's like this cycle that can go around. And it's like, and they have independent circles of their own that go on, right? And it's like the circles aren't isolated things. And so it's like if we all start helping each other and doing this mentality of like, I'm going to lift you up, you're going to lift me up, you're going to lift them up, they're going to lift their friends up. You know, it all it all can help each other. And we Absolutely. can all really, really benefit from that and succeed in life, man. But it's it's there's a lot of uh I don't know, fear, I would say. Fear oh, instead of love, you know, or like um hoarding or like trying to feel like uh like Sad Guru always says, Man, I love Sad Guru. And he says, uh he says, You can only be happy when everybody else around you has less than you. He goes, then you feel like you're a big man. Then you feel like you're a success because you have more than the other people that you are around. So that makes you successful. And he goes, that's ridiculous. He goes, they're doing, they're doing worse. So they're worse off. That makes you happy. He goes, you see that that's a sickness, right? Like, that's not a good thing. Yeah, exactly. That's, a, that's, a, that's an excellent way of putting it. I mean, <laughs> you know, it goes back to that whole thing of, like, people feeling like anything good happening for someone else is somehow at their expense. I mean, like. Even if it's even if it's stuff they didn't want, yeah. Um, and you know the whole thing with um, you know, like the whole thing with like, you know, wanting, you know, I, I never understood this mentality of like, you know, it's uh, not necessarily wanting things to be better, but just wanting to make enough money so that the problems don't no longer apply to you. Yeah. Like to me, that's not that's not fixing anything. And and the thing is, like, I'm not saying that you know people have to like you know be the be all end all for everyone. That no one can be that. But it's like you can be that for your circle. You can be that for your individual community, you know, where the word actually applies. And, you know, so I think and I think maybe that's kind of maybe that's as a society kind of what we need to get back to is not so much worrying about trying to, you know, change the world, but trying to change the block. Yeah, you can't change the world. The yeah. world's going to do its thing. And the world's always getting better. I know it feels like in the moment, it always feels like everything's so fucked. And uh, everything's just like, you know, really just how could we survive this, right? But it's like, it's always kind of felt like that. And here we are, man. I mean, we, you and I have been doing this 36 years, man. And it's always kind of felt like the world's coming against you pretty hard. And like, how are we going to survive through all this chaos and and hatred and like just negative energy, man. And it's like we still keep going and we still keep going. And, and ultimately, the world is is way better than it's ever been. And I, I love reading history books because you read about how fucking crazy it was and how horrible people's lives were. But they were doing their thing. They were loving life, man, you know, and they were living to maybe 30 years old and then dying of some fucking bacterial infection, you know, because they didn't even have antibiotics. And uh, and so it's like everything's so great, but it's so easy to get trapped in uh, in the few things that are going wrong and they expand in your consciousness and make it seem like they're just such a huge deal and they're so overwhelming because i mean that's what we do right like your your mind is a problem solving computer so it finds problems and then it focuses on the problems and then it makes it its primary goal and uh and really i mean when it boils down to i had this thought the other day where it was like Really, there's not that much bad shit going on because if you watch the news and you watch any of this stuff that people are force feeding you, all this as much negative shit as they could possibly find, they are scouring the globe 
looking for all the worst stories and all the most outrageous shit they can come up with, right? And what is this? It's like this loop. They can't come up with anything. And so they keep they keep repeating the same shit to you because there's not that much bad shit going on anymore, man. And people are just like assuming problems and people look creating for things to be, problems. Yeah, people look for things to be angry about. I mean, yeah. like, like I, I thought it was so, like, hilarious, that whole thing with Tucker Carlson getting so mad about the Eminem character That's redesigns. hilarious. I was yeah. like... I was like, dude, you want a fucking Eminem? Like, I mean, it's whatever, yeah. man. It's 2022, but dude, like, yeah. you're kind of you're like, ugh. That's like, exactly what I'm talking yeah, about, right? Was, He's doing like, a whole segment on the outrage over the Eminem changing their shoes. Yeah, There's like, nothing. They got nothing. Yeah. The world is that beautiful, man. And there's just that much fucking love out there that all these fucking mongoloids that want to just force negative energy down your throat... They, they just, they scour the whole planet, man, and they got nothing, man. There's just a few things going on at this point in, the, in history, man. You know, a few things. There's like a little skirmish in Ukraine, a little skirmish in Taiwan, man, you know, and like they're going to blow that shit up as hard as they can. And I know those are horrible things. And I'm not trying to downplay those, but we're talking about in the history of the world, man, the whole world has been at war, massive wars forever, just millions and millions of people dying, you know, and just horrible shit happening on top of a horrible thing and now it's like we're down to the point where there's two little skirmishes and maybe israel and palestine going on right like there's this little things are happening but not all out fucking global war just complete just massive countries dominating each other and millions tens of millions hundreds of millions of people dying all the fucking time man you know it's just it, there's just not that much bad shit happening anymore but it gets shoved down our throats like this, this is the, this is all you're supposed to think about, man. Because they don't want you fucking focused in on all the love and great things that are going on. And everybody's, there's so many people out there doing I think such good things. I think fear sells more than anything, and it and, does. And, and, and and it and it's and it applies to everything. It applies to media. It applies to economics. I mean, like, I mean, the biggest thing that I, you know, one thing I realized in the last year was just how big of a killer FOMO is. The whole fear you're missing out 100 yeah. percent, especially economically because it's like because it's like and that's and that's really especially you know like you know like going back to like a lot of like the crypto nft stuff that was something that really kind of to me was a red flag was like you know when when you've got people like pushing certain coins or pushing certain things and they're not really telling you what it does or what it's going to be for but they're just emphasizing that you have to do it right now or you're gonna miss out on something oh yeah and it's and it's it's so and especially like when you look at the majority of people buying those, I mean, it's mostly people like, you know, in the middle class. It's mostly middle class guys, mostly younger guys who, you know, are in that same boat of feeling like, you know, they're looking at, you know, their day job and how much they don't like it. They're looking at, you know, their boss being a dick. They're looking at the fact that, you know, they were sold this bill of goods of like, well, you know, if you work hard and play by the rules, your life's going to be great and you're going to, you know, get a six figure income and get the girl you want and all this other stuff. And they're realizing in their early to mid 20s that that's probably bullshit. And they're actively looking for something that they can latch on to. And the thing is, like. You know, yeah, it's like, you know, you get guys who latch on to art or you get guys who latch on to music or who latch on to a job that's good or they, you know, they meet the right person or they, you know, find something worthwhile investing in. And then you get those guys who get who tumble down the wrong rabbit hole and end up, you know, freaking trying to storm the Capitol. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like it's it's scary to me because it's like. I sometimes wonder if we're maybe, you know, running the risk of losing an entire generation of men to this shit. We are, man. You know, I think everybody's being so focused on their fucking pronouns and their identity and their victimhood and their outrage and just like how the world fucking owes them everything and everybody's coming against them. And it's like none of that matters, man. That's all just bullshit, man. Like nobody cares First of all, what you identify as. At this point in society, there's like a very small fraction of people out there that are bigots that are going to fucking give a shit who you have sex with or what color your skin is, man. So it's like running around and acting like this is a big deal. It's not. And like attaching all your conscious effort into this character that you're playing, it's only going to make you fucking miserable. It's only going to bring you down because you're trying to prove how real you are and how real this imaginary character you're creating in your head 
and bring and trying to bring it into the reality is and it's like and identifying yourself with that physicality of of your nature and that being the only thing that matters that's just that's just going to cause so much suffering to society and it's not going to keep people on track as to like how to actually like live their fucking life you know like go out and and provide for their family man and love everybody they're all just focused in on on themselves so hard you know and like what you're supposed to fucking call me any hour of the day or how you're supposed to fucking talk to me and you know what am i offended about now you know and it's just like dude fucking get over yourself man you know like love people there's just a lot of love out there and getting indulged in all this identity politics bullshit uh, attachment to ego and self, man. It's just the wrong direction, I think, man. I really do. Like, it's it be whoever you want, man, you know? But it's like, don't make it such a big fucking deal. Have sex with whoever you want. No one fucking cares anymore, man, you know? But it's like so much outrage around it. And so much victimization around it. And it's just like... It's, it's, it's only hurting the self, whenever we dive into that and we're so self-indulgent in those matters. And I just, I really don't like how hard it's pushed on people, you know, to like create this big giant avatar in your head and then live by it, you know? And it's like, just be a person, man. I don't know. That's, some people might not agree with that. I know you probably don't agree with that, but I just think it hurts people, man. I think it hurts people in a real like deep way to think that that's all they are. I, I, I do definitely want to respond to what you're saying on this. Um, yeah. I was kind of thinking about, about, you know, how to respond in the sense of like, you know, kind of thinking in terms of like, you know, m my perspective on some of this stuff, I can tell you that my perspective is a bit different on it because I look at it from the angle of, you know, I mean, I grew up, as a kid being a fat, weird looking kid who talked too much, who was too hyper and was obsessed with random crap. So I got the crap bullied out of me. It was what it was. People made fun of me. I usually would heckle them back. And you know, once I made them laugh, it was fine. And I've had times in my life where people have, you know, wanted to physically threaten me or give me shit because they thought I was something that I wasn't or be thought they thought I was trying to represent something that I wasn't. And I know how much that hurt me on a personal level, even though it didn't actually even apply to me. And I can't even imagine how I would have felt if any of those things had, because I couldn't imagine what it would feel like to wake up every day feeling like I'm trapped inside of a body that isn't mine or in a lifestyle that isn't mine in a society that doesn't understand, that doesn't want to understand, and that actively, you know, is persecuting me anytime I speak out about it. And are things better now than they were 20 years ago? Sure. Are they that much better? I really don't know, considering that, you know, I mean, when you look at the statistics of people who are victims of assault, people who are victims of hate crimes, people who are the victims of murders, things like that, that's the one demographic that those numbers haven't changed. If anything, they've gone up and that's scary as hell to me because it's, and what I'm finding is that, you know, I, like I said, I think about, you know, what it would be like from a mental perspective to know that I'm not where I'm supposed to be, but there's nothing I can physically do about it. And I can't get people to acknowledge who I feel like I really am. And I do think that it's good that as a society, we are starting to move away from that. And I will say this, I mean, from my perspective, I look at it and what's interesting is it's like a lot of, a lot of the people who are making that transition aren't, it's not, a lot of them aren't younger people. A lot of them are older people. A lot of them are people in their forties and fifties and sixties, people who've lived their lives, but who've lived their lives with this one aspect that they can never really 
you know, embrace or never really explain to people like, hey, this is who I am. They always had. So it's like I can't imagine living my entire life, even a successful life and having that big of an asterisk next to everything about me. That would that would that would hurt me so much. So I absolutely. That's yeah, what I'm saying. Yeah. And and I think that um, and I think it's definitely something that, you know, a lot of people it's it's something that I feel like. I even come from a place, even though, like I said, even though, you know, it's like, even though I come from a place of having been bullied and stuff and things like that, I was, it was never a situation, at the end of the day, I always knew in the back of my mind, well, yeah, this doesn't apply to me, or yeah, this isn't me, or yeah, you know, that person's just a jerk. But, I mean, if you're a 15-year-old kid dealing with this stuff, and you're being told that stuff every day, what does that do to you? What does yeah. that do to what does that do to a kid? What does that do to like a what does that do to like a forty something year old with you know grown kids who finally realizes hey you know what like I'm really unhappy and I need to do something about this. So I kind of come at it more from the perspective of anything that a person can do that is not harming anyone else and that is making their life even a microcosm easier to live. I'm all for it. And, and I feel like it's not really, it's, it's, I look at it from the perspective of, you know, if we want people as, if we want our society to function effectively, if we want it to function in the sense of people feeling like they have a sense of purpose, feeling like, you know, that there is a reason for them to get out of bed in the morning. There's a reason for them to go to their job. There's a reason for them to, you know, spend extra time with their family. There's a reason for them to be nice to a random person on the street. The, for those things to happen, it all boils, it all comes back to that person being comfortable with themselves and not feeling like they have to either live in fear of everyone or feeling like they have to attack anyone who they even think is attacking them. And that's the thing. I think a lot of times when people feel like the identity politics stuff is being shoved down their throat or it's being, you know, forced on them, a lot of the time, I think what that really is, is essentially somebody who's been sucker punched their entire life trying to punch you before you punch them. And I'm not saying that that necessarily makes it a, a viable tactic, but I do think that it's something that maybe a lot of people don't think about when they're coming into this stuff. I mean, I can tell you that I've had times I've never, I mean, this is an example of this. I have never once in my life been bullied because I was white. I have had people want to fight me or call me things because they thought I wasn't. I have never been bullied in my life for being straight. I've had people want to fight me or attack me because they thought I wasn't. Mm -hmm. I've had people, you know, do the, well, what are you thing? And I'm like, well, I'm a human being. The fuck are you? That's my point right there. The whole, you're just a human being, you know, having a human experience, man. And for me, I see a lot of kids who are very, um, what's it called? Easily influenced. You know, when you're younger, you're, you're out there seeking and searching and trying to figure this whole game out. And all this shit's being shoved into their brain that isn't necessary, man. And there's several things that, that uh, you were saying that lead to that idea, right? You're like, you're like, well, this is what I'm supposed to be, right? And it's like, you're not supposed to be anything, right? You're just, you are you, man. And you're perfect exactly the way you are right now. And the whole, well, I'm not this or I'm not that, I'm not this, right? You're none of it. And the, the whole time you're none of it. And it's the, it's the separation that we create uh, from ourselves and from our self-identity that really liberates our minds to be who we really are, man. And it's like when we're, when we're being forced into this trap of the separate self and the separate ego and all this, this game of like identifying and playing this character role, right? And then identifying ourselves as that character we're creating and then thinking that that's all we are in this existence. That's where a lot of the suffering comes from. And like in the game of Buddhism and in the game of like Taoism and uh, a lot of the Eastern philosophies, man, it comes to the point of like taking a step back from all that because all that, and it doesn't matter what that is, right? It's, it's just say for me, right? Let's just say this guy is a, just a white guy who's straight and you know, it's 
has blonde hair and blue eyes, right? It's like, that's not who I am. That's a character that I'm playing. This guy Jason's just a character. And the less I identify with the character and the less I associate myself with all these roles that are being put on me, the more liberated I am to just be love and compassion and kindness and love myself and love everyone around me. It's when we're so caught up in building these character roles and uh, identifying with them that all this suffering comes into play because you're constantly having to reassure yourself, reconfirm, reassure, get other, other people to agree with the illusion that you've created with your own ego. And they go, I'll pretend you're you as long as you pretend I'm me kind of game. And I see this suffering being forced on people, make, people being forced to make all these decisions and, and saying, okay, I'm going to check these boxes and this is who I'm going to be the rest of my fucking life. And that's the kind of suffering I'm, I'm talking about mm -hmm. where it's, it's all the, the true liberation comes from removing yourself from all those identities, removing yourself from the thought that all I am is this body in this three-dimensional world, right? Yeah, you're more than the boxes you check on your census form. Yeah, and uh, and that's what I'm talking about that causes so much suffering because there's there people are people are just being pigeonholed into these simple experiences and being told that they have to identify with all these things to fit in and to participate, you mm -hmm. know. And I I just it's it's the exact opposite of all things you find about coming to peace with yourself and learning how to uh, be a mindful, loving awareness in this universe and all these different things that come from Eastern philosophies, this is the exact opposite tactic. It's the exact opposite thing of finding peace and clarity in your life is to, is to push into the illusion and to, and to come up with more ways to identify with this body and more ways to create identities around the ego, you know, and... Uh, it's just, it's self-indulgent and it is attachment. And attachment is like the root cause of suffering. And that's what I'm talking about. And okay. it's cool. Be whatever you want to be, man. You know, but what I'm saying is that when people are so heavily encouraged to do these things, that's, that's doing the exact opposite of offering them sincere peace and bliss and mindfulness in life it's it's the exact opposite of that practice you're you're literally leading people through the gates of hell and suffering and attachment to be like you got to pick all these things and that's who you fucking are you know and i and i don't agree with that being forced on influential or um, easily influenced minds of like children stuff like that you know kids are like six years old talking about being fucking demisexual it's like no fucking six-year-old 20 years ago had any concept of any of this stuff, man, because it's this, these are illusionary egotistical terms, man. You know, they're just a kid who wants to play ball. And, and so you're, you're like early on development. You're and to fit in with their friends. They all have to come up with all these different things that make them who they are. And it's just like, you're just, you're just grinding suffering into their subconscious at the earliest possible stages you can do it. Yeah, I mean, the, the American public school system is basically designed to be boot camp for a service industry job. It's basically yeah. like, you're basically, it's basically designed to, to force conformity on you. It's designed to force you to fit in a box. I mean, and the thing is, like, I think a big reason why bullying is so prevalent in schools is because schools actually want it. Schools want bullying because it makes it easier. Bullies basically act like the wardens at a prison. Basically, it's like, you know, the school, I think a lot of schools and a lot of teachers don't mind bullying because they see it as well. You know, this person's going to keep things in line or at least, you know, you know, keep things from getting too nuts. And it's like, if I just have to deal with one person being a problem as opposed to 10. Yeah. And, and, and it's like, and you know, I always hear, and I hear the thing all the time of like, well, you know, that's all the real world's going to be. And it's like, yeah, except not really there's stuff that people get away with in school that if you did it in polite society you'd you know at best get punched in the face and at worst spend the night in jail so oh, it's definitely like, and I mean, schools and, like prison rules you and, know, and, and teaching and, and teach and teaching kids and young adults that that attitude and those things are okay isn't setting them up for success in the real world if anything you're setting them up for disaster the first time they pull that crap on someone who isn't going to take it yeah 
I mean, well, but you learn how to not take it by dealing with the. I mean, I grew up, I I grew up in fucking Stockton, man. Like I went to like an all black school. They had white Wednesdays where they beat the shit out of a random white kid every Wednesday. You know, it was like it was rough, man. You know, it was rough. It was Stocks is a rough fucking town. Yeah, it was basically like living in a fucking prison. It was like you hang out with the white kids, black kids hang out. You know, and there's like really racial, seg- racially segregated uh, systems going on, and uh, and and there's a lot of that that bullying and everything. But I still feel like um, there's these social cues that get developed uh, through the the natural bullying, even even within your own circles of like bullying, picking on each other, giving each other a hard time. Uh, not exactly just running around beating the shit out of each other for lunch money, but you know, like if you wear a dumb fucking hat and your friends are all like, "What is that?" You know what I mean? And there's like these checks and balances that go on that allow us to adapt our own social cues and correct the behavior of each other to where we all kind of, there's like this normalization that goes on as, a, as opposed to like these insane skews that people can take when no one's allowed to criticize anybody for anything that they do. Not, to, I'm not saying that, that beating the shit out of people for lunch money or, or physical violence. No, of course not. But I'm talking about it's like more like uh, just not allowing people to go so far off into the left field that they're uh, they're completely unrelatable to the rest of the social circle anymore. Yeah. You know, there's these checks and balances that are allowed to occur. I think, a, yeah, I think, I think one of the things you learn and I think one of the things you definitely learn in school, I mean, ideally, is kind of like learning that not everyone has the same boundaries in the sense of like there are people that I can have a conversation like this with and it's totally fine. There's also people that I wouldn't have a conversation like this with because I know it would turn into an argument. Oh, yeah. Not through any intention on their part or mine, but it just would naturally turn into one. There's also jokes that I would make with some people that I know they would find funny. There's jokes I wouldn't tell people because other people because I know they would find it offensive. And there's jokes I just won't say at all because they're offensive, period. And I think a lot of it, too, is like, I mean, you know, I mean, I have friends where literally all we do is bust each other's balls and pick on each other the entire time we're together. And it's fine because we know that expectation. I also have friends where I have to be really careful about not just how I talk to them, but what tone I use, you know, where we go, things like that, you know, just so that I'm being, you know, respectful of their boundaries and of the things that they're comfortable doing and not doing and, you know, things like that. And and that's totally OK. To me, it's like I can look at that on a case by case basis and say, OK, you know what? This is the price of admission for being in this person's life. This is the price of admission for being this person's friend. Yeah. And that's OK. What what bothers me is, you know, like you said, there are a lot of people where they kind of expect everyone, the entire world to kind of like match, match up to their, their, uh, their, you know, idiosyncrasies and their, you know, their, uh, their, uh, you know, personal, you know, hangups and things. Yeah. And then on the flip side, you have people who basically have the attitude of, well, you know, you know, that, that barreling through life attitude of like, you know, well, you know, I don't care if I hurt people's feelings. I don't care if I offend people because, you know, it's just about me. And they're both egotistical. They both come from, I think, oh, yeah. it's weird. It's like it's self-centered like, as hell. They're, they're two sides of the same shitty coin. Yeah. It's And, you know, I think finding that balance is saying, okay, you know, I know that I can, you know, engage with people this way. I also know what these people, I know that. And also, like, being able to read people's, like, you know, emotional reactions to things and, like, knowing when to stop. And, like, knowing when to say, hey, you know what, no, dial this back a bit. Or, hey, you know, hey, let's change the subject. Like, knowing knowing how to do that, I think that's... That also, I think, is something that a lot of people are kind of having to relearn how to do now because of the fact that we've been cooped up for a year and a half. Um, that's one thing that I've also observed a lot in the six months of being back, you know, doing shows and going out to places is like there's a lot of people who kind of, you know, it's like, quite frankly, kind of forgot their home training. <laughs> yeah. Where it's like they're kind of having to, like, relearn that stuff. And I'm – initially it was the sort of thing that bothered me a lot. It bothered me a lot more when I first started going out again. And then I kind of thought about it and I was like, you know what? These people are all in the same boat I was in. And a lot of them didn't have a family that they were staying with who was helping out. Or a lot of them didn't have a partner who was with them. A lot of them were literally by themselves. A lot of them were literally slumming it. So, you know, I can't really judge them on that. All I can really judge someone on is how they're treating me, you know, in the moment. And, you know, but the thing is, I do like to factor in those other things. I mean, like if someone's being a jerk, my initial in public, my initial reaction is kind of usually be like, oh, well, that was kind of crappy, but I'll let it slide because I don't know what's going on in their day. If someone's being deliberately antagonizing someone, that's different. 
Yeah. But I mean, you know, how many times have like you been through like an entire day where like, you know, a bunch of little things go wrong and then all it takes is like someone saying the wrong thing to you or saying something to you in the wrong tone or even like just something getting in your way for half a second for you to like, you know, get really upset. And it's like you're not really upset at them. You're not even really upset at the thing. You're upset at like the accumulation of things that you've been bottling up the entire day. That's that's something honestly that like I'm trying to figure out how to deal with and I'm pushing 40. That's right. a mindfulness exercise right there, man. That's what that is. Every time one of those little things comes through, you have to bring yourself back to the breath and 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 let you have to let so much stuff go constantly and constantly just be breathing and I do mantra as well and like nothing is nothing's ever happening. You're never really going anywhere. There's always just this collected center of self that exists as the world morphs around you and the people that you're having conversations with change and maybe the activity that your hands are doing is different, but it's like constantly just following the breath and nothing matters, nothing's, nothing's of any significant value and you, all things just are. That's, that's the most important thing to accept in life, right? Is like things just are. The one, like the number one cognitive distortion people need to get rid of is the should word. Should and shouldn't. You got to pull those out of your vocabulary. Things should, there's no, nothing that should be different and nothing that shouldn't be the way it is. Things are at this moment. And there's nothing anyone can do about it. It's already this moment. And uh, all you're doing is hurting yourself by thinking that it can be any other way. Yeah, there's like there's I mean, there's definitely such a thing as can be, but can be and should are definitely two different yeah. things. Should is like a retroactive. Well, I should have done this yeah. can be as well. Yeah, I screwed up. But if I do this right, it can be better next time. Yeah. I mean, it's the difference between like, you know, me making a bet making a hockey bet on an underdog and them losing and me being like mad about it saying, well, I should have bet on the other team and saying, and me saying, well, you know, I lost that bet, but you know what? I think the reason why I lost this bet was because I didn't, you know, factor in this or that. So next time I'm going to factor that in and next time I'll win. Yeah. And that's, that's, yeah, that's, and I'll fully admit one of the things that's been challenging for me on a personal level in the last couple of years has been like simultaneously, becoming more self-aware and trying to figure out where the line is between self-awareness and self-deprecation Yeah, in the sense of like being aware of the things that I need to fix or being aware of the things that are going on around me, but at the same time, not letting that awareness bog down into, well, shit sucks and I can't do anything about it. Yeah. That's not the right attitude. Yeah. Honestly, all things are just full of love, man. Like the world is just, it's all perspective and the world is a huge, extremely beautiful place and um and it's all about just changing your perspective man i was a highly pessimistic person and now i wake up and i'm just grateful for the sunrise and i just i'm just in love with the clouds nothing these are nothing things man these are things that happen every day and they make my day man and that's awesome it's it's totally possible for everybody to be that way it's just dissolving the self and dissolving all these these negative self-talk bullshit cognitive distortions that we have in ourselves man and i really wish i could keep talking about it but i am i am running out of time oh, on my course. recorder i'm sorry um, and this has been a great conversation man and uh, I'd love to have you back on to talk more about Anytime. this. Two hours went by like that, dude. And it's just fucking great talking to you, man. It's great talking you to know? you, too, man. Anytime. And, uh, and so let me do the thing. I'd like to thank my guest, concert promoter, Pulsar Presents, Patrick Pulsar Trout. Check him out at pulsarpresents.com, which should be up by the time this airs. Brand yep. new website. Uh, Pulsar Presents at Instagram. Pulsar Presents 702 at Facebook. Pulsar Smash at TikTok. And Pulsar Smash 702 at Twitter. Awesome. Awesome, man. Well, we are out of here, brother. Any last words? Uh, be good to each other and uh, support your local scene. That's it right there, man. Peace. Thank you for watching To The Fullest with Jason Froberg. You can check out more podcasts right here and subscribe by clicking right here.